It's a great pleasure to have Professor Gautam Mandal from Department of Theoretical Physics, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Uh, everybody knows what the expertise area of Gautam. Gautam mainly works on quantum gravity, ADA CFTs, and the things related to a little bit bondage matter systems. He will talk about a very interesting topic today, which is thermalization in statistical systems and lessons for black holes. But before starting, I just, those who don't know Gautam, just for them, I want to introduce Gautam a little bit more. Gautam did his uh, PhD from TIFR. Then he was a postdoc at IAS Princeton. Then uh, Gautam joined as a faculty at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. In between, he was a uh, uh, sabbatical in CERN, Perimeter, and many, many institutes. Gautam is a very good teacher. And Gautam uh, has like, uh, so I will not uh, uh, go through on so many uh, expertise uh, of Gautam. We used to call Gautam as a uh, archive. Like when I was in TIFR, if I have any pro problem, I always go goes to Gautam, and Gautam always give any some references. So uh, you will get to know about all this during the talk. So thank you, Gautam, for uh, uh, for the uh, for your agreement that uh, you are giving this talk in this forum. This is the 53rd QASTM Zoominar, and uh, we are thanking uh, you for participating in this um, talk uh, from Potsdam and now Nizer both. So you can start, Gautam. Okay, thank you, Shantan, for inviting me to give a talk on this forum. And um, uh, yeah, I'd, I'm not going to be an archive um, uh, today, not too many references, but if people ask me, then I can dig them out. Uh, all the references are, of course, in the papers. Um, okay, let's go. So the, the topic is thermalization in statistical systems. And uh, so part of the talk would be about the StatMix systems themselves. And the other part of the talk is um, about uh, a simple, very simple StatMix system. That's called the SYK model and what it uh, can teach us about black holes, some, some aspect uh, of that, uh, which uh, we have worked on. And um, so, so let me go. Right. So what's thermalization? So the question is the following. So let us say that you have a certain given system and it starts from a given initial state. So the question is that does it equilibrate? And is the equilibrium described by a thermal ensemble? Okay, so there's also the question of what is meant by uh, it being uh, it, uh, that the the statement that the uh, system equilibrates uh, with respect to what choice of observables and so on. We will come to that in, in detail. Now, this simple question has a profound significance. Uh, firstly, it bears on the foundations of statistical mechanics. So if it does equilibrate and if the equilibrium is given by thermal ensemble or some generalizations of thermal ensemble, which we will come to, um, like grand canonical ensembles and or the uh, you know, generalized Gibbs ensemble for integrable systems and so on. So let us say it does equilibrate and it is given by uh, one of these ensembles. Then it is uh, familiar territory. It is given by the standard uh, rules of statistical mechanics and thermodynamics. Um, so, and then uh, we can apply that whatever we have learned from textbooks. On the other hand, there are systems uh, which do not equilibrate, okay? And there are systems which equilibrate, but it retain the memory of the initial state, like the uh, many body localization systems. So here in, in, in both the situations, familiar thermodynamics fails to work and new tools are needed to describe memory, et cetera. So in this talk, we will report on some results uh, in which we will focus on two recent uh, examples that uh, we have been working uh, on. One is a pure statistical mechanics system without any uh, relation to gravity. 
and the other is a holographic system. All right. So <clears throat> now, um, so that so now there's a more fundamental question related to this, which we which actually will take us to uh, uh, the black hole issues, which is the following: that suppose that we have a closed system in a given initial state. If we say that thermalization happens, it seems to say that you know a pure state, a system starting with a pure state, ends up at a thermal state. Okay, thermal state is a mixed state, uh, so. It, it seems that we start with the pure state, we do something to the system, uh, you know, a disturbance which we will model by quantum quench, and that that process, uh, you know, changes the, uh, you know, so where, and, and the quantum quench will describe by time dependent Hamiltonian. So it remains within, um, you know, the Hamiltonian evolution. And we know that, you know, by standard rules of quantum mechanics, uh, a pure state to mixed state evolution cannot happen. Okay, so how can thermalization happen? So the answer lies in what one means by thermalization. It is that the full system does remain in a pure state, but observables of interest, such as local observables in a subsystem, they reach initial, uh, uh, they reach uh, some. So here's a, here's a, here's a graphical uh, uh, in a portrait of uh, what really happens. So this is, this is a classical. So if you have some uh, you know, particles, some marbles, uh, you know, left at one corner of the, uh, somehow I'm losing my cursor, oh, here it is. Okay, got it. Right. So what we do is to start with, uh, let's say all these particles at, one corner of this room, of this little box, and let them uh, let them go. Okay, so the 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 you know these guys, they all will have some velocity. So there's like Im imagine that it's a, like a um, you know uh, evacuating a room and introducing some uh, air molecules uh, at one corner. Okay, so of course they will all expand into the rest of the room. And uh, eventually, you will find that uh, as hello? a Brownian motion type of thing. No, these are just uh, you know standard molecules with um, with uh, hard sphere collisions. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, hard sphere collisions and and uh, uh, reflections of the walls. Okay, okay. that's uh, that's the rule that has been taught to this uh, uh, computer simulation, mm -hmm. and uh, you can get this from Wikipedia. And uh, what you will find is that eventually, if you if you take any uh, you know any particular region, okay, on an average there is a certain density of uh, molecules in that in that region. It's not like there is a there is a, the, you know all the time there is a certain density of molecules number of molecules in in a particular region. As you can see, you know this little red circle that I have drawn, okay, it doesn't always have the same number of molecules, but on an average it does. So that's that's normalization, and uh, so quant the quantum mechanical statement is that it remains that the system remains in a pure state, but there are appropriate observables which you can um, which you can measure, and those observables will see as if the system has gone into a, into a mixed state. It has equilibrated to some homogeneous. So in this case, it's that the homogeneous state you can talk about finally uh, you know a homogeneous density uh, of air molecules in this. So in this little simulation, of course, there are some, uh, very, you know, rather small number of um, molecules which have been taken. But this, this, uh, this you can get from the Wikipedia page, as I said. But you can do this for a much larger number of molecules, and you will see eventually that the uh, total number of uh, uh, molecules in, in in any particular region it does um, stay fairly constant. Uh, you know, it, it fluctuates around some average, but the fluctuation becomes smaller and smaller as you as you keep increasing the number of molecules. Okay. So the so there is there is a uh, uh, there is a, uh, a you know quantitative formulation of uh, this uh, concept. It's called Boltzmann H theorem. 
so Boltzmann H theorem is, uh, you know, so, there, so some of these things are probably uh, well known. So I'm not going to uh, spend too much time. So there's a there's a uh, there's a quantity that you can um, uh, you know describe in terms of phase space densities. In terms of phase space densities. Um, uh, Uh, in terms of phase space densities, um, or uh, you know, in 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 quantum mechanics, there is a uh, there is an analogous notion uh, involving von Neumann entropies, uh, and so on. So the uh, uh, so if you construct this quantity for uh, for uh, for a system, then uh, what you're supposed to see is a sort of monotonic behavior. So the Boltzmann H theorem says that this quantity is actually uh, monotonically increasing in times. But what you actually see in, in, a, in a simulation is uh, some graph which is not really uh, monotonically uh, increasing. It, it, on an average, it does monotonically increase. But um, you know, if you zoom any particular part of it, it has uh, a fluctuation around it. So these fluctuations they actually um, sort of remember what pure state uh, the system is uh, in. And um, so um, the fact that, uh, you know, Maybe Boltzmann let me, so, so one sh a short question. So yeah. in this uh, setup so far that you considered, uh, does uh, integrability play, play uh, any role here so far? Or is it... Yeah. Um, Good point. So I'm, I'm coming to that uh, soon. Uh, you know, the the... Uh, the point is, it, what, it, it used to be said that, uh, you know, in uh, integral systems, you cannot have uh, you know, thermalization uh, and you cannot have, uh, the, you know, the um, monotonic behavior of this kind. Uh, but uh, there are quantities that you can look at, which uh, involves the von Neumann entropy of uh, uh, some um, subsystem of the total system. And uh, that is the object that uh, that equilibrates. So I'm I'm coming to that uh, soon. That's that's a good. But uh, hold on for the answer to this uh, question. So normally one one talks about this this equilibrium here. When one talks about this equilibrium, uh, one talks about the thermal equilibrium. Okay, and uh, so uh, so th thermalization. Used to, be, I mean, even like before, uh, like more than 15 years before, people used to think that um, uh, you know integrability and thermalization do not uh, go together. But due to some uh, pioneering work, due to uh, Marcus Rigol and uh, Calabrese and various other um, people, uh, a, a, a large number of uh, you know very ingenious work. Uh, it uh, it was shown that um, uh, integrability and thermalization can happen, can uh, be together in the, in the sense of local thermalization, which I'm going to describe in in detail. Okay, so just just to say that uh, you know uh, a pure monotonicity of the um, uh, H theorem uh, is uh, uh, not possible. So there were these paradoxes which were found soon enough after Boltzmann uh, proposed the H theorem. Uh, one is called the Zermelo theorem uh, paradox, uh, which uh, derives from Poincare refer uh, recurrence, which says that um, you know in a in a in a finite uh, uh, so if, if you have a system with a finite energy and uh, in a finite volume, then uh, you know there's this uh, famous uh, theorem of Poincare that uh, if you start from a phase point. Then um, uh, you know follow the evolution of the phase point. Then uh, in 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 a large enough time, the the, the phase point comes uh, arbitrarily close uh, to to the initial um, point. Okay, uh, so given any epsilon, uh, you know there is a time uh, uh, by which the the phase point comes back to within an epsilon radius of the initial point. So which means that um, you know clearly uh, if there is a construct like an H, it must come back after that time to the initial value. So uh, this graph, this graph must have uh, uh, departures, okay? Departures in the sense that it, it should have uh, big dips like this at larger times, okay? So this, this graph here, of course, doesn't go 
to times which are large enough for that. So for very large uh, values of n, uh, that those those time scales are astronomically large. But in matters of principle, um, you know, H theorem uh, cannot be true. And then there is the uh, the other uh, thing, you know, from T symmetry. This is called Lorentz uh, paradox. That if you uh, go from one particular initial condition to to a final condition, and um, uh, your h has increased, and then you reverse all the velocities um, uh, after you reach there, okay, uh, something that uh, Maxwell's demon uh, is uh, supposed uh, to be able to do. Uh, so then, of course, uh, you know the 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 time reverse motion. Uh, should also be allow allowed because the microscopic, uh, you know, laws are time symmetric. Uh, then, if uh, if the your initial uh, profile was like this, that it went up like that, then um, it must come down when you reverse all the velocities. So this is called Lorentz paradox, and this in actually in there are, there are practical applications of these uh, things. Practical ramifications. Of course, I'm just. I want to ask: uh, Is there is any connection yeah. with this uh, Longschmidt echo with the quantum chaos? Longschmidt echoes actually have found, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, applications or um, you know the they're useful things to consider in a large number of uh, in a large number of situations. And um, uh, it's yeah maybe they are also um, uh, they have been found useful in uh, describing chaotic behavior. I'm not sure about that. Okay. Maybe. All right. So therefore, you can have violation of H theorem, and um, the so the basically the this is what you know, what I've said here that the wiggles of the plot violate monotonicity all the time to uh, to uh, but the fluctuations around the uh, basic average uh, curve uh, become smaller and smaller as uh, you make the time um, uh, sorry the, the number of particles uh, grow larger okay uh, so the the fact that there is uh, a microscopic nature of the system, like these little balls uh, uh, colliding with each other, that uh, so these wiggles of the uh, H function, they are uh, an evidence of that. Okay, so um, now, so we we were basically uh, discussing uh, this question that whether pure states can go into mixed state. And uh, we convinced ourselves that uh, pure states really don't go to, go to a mixed state. Pure states remain pure states, and um, which are evidenced by wiggles in the H uh, function, or um, uh, you know, uh, basically the fact that we, we are going to we, we are going to say this uh, a little more um, quantitative by um, introducing the notion of local thermalization and reduced density matrices in which we will see exactly what quantities do uh, go to uh, go to a thermal uh, state it's not the state of the whole system but it the, is the uh, effective state of a, uh, of a subsystem okay now uh, uh, exactly this kind of a question does appear in the, in the issue of black holes and in particular uh, in Hawking's information uh, loss problem. So this is called the Hawking's information loss problem, uh, uh, the problem of formation, okay? The, the fact, so, uh, so there, are, there are two aspects of the information loss problem. One is the fact that so many different kinds of uh, uh, collapsing matter seem to lead to the same uh, black hole. Uh, that itself is a puzzle and, uh, you know, and the, Therefore, the same black hole meaning that you know the, it, it seems that the accessible information uh, are only the ones that are allowed by the no health theorem, namely the uh, the gate charges of the system, uh, which are the mass, charge, and angular momentum in the, the in the usual black holes. And uh, so then the you know what what explains the entropy of the black hole if uh, you have a, a sort of unique unique black hole. So. Uh, uh, so this again is the same same question that you know a pure state has has 
uh, pure state of collapsing matter really turned into a, a mixed state or not? Or are there wiggles in the black hole uh, context as well? Okay, so, uh, so this is what I've said here, that is there some, um, you know, is there a similar resolution of the problem uh, as in the statistical mechanics system that uh, it's not going to uh, mix state really, but a limited set of observables perceive the black hole uh, while the full set of observables perceive uh, a pure state. So here, uh, there's the usual story of uh, the picture of gravitational collapse, uh, as you can see from textbooks, that you start at some time t equal to zero with the collapsing matter, which is in a, in a, in a pure state, and then it lands up uh, as being a black hole with the horizon here and the singularity here. And uh, this seems to be a unique uh, state, irrespective of what initial state you started with. And here there are, uh, in the context of ADS CFT, there are uh, actual calculations that you can do um, where uh, you know, a, a pure state um, of uh, null shells, uh, collapsing null shells actually uh, uh, change the original uh, you know, ADS vacuum to an ADS black hole, and that uh, appears to be a, a mixed state. So in fact, the, um, the issue is made uh, you know, even more, um, uh, you can make it even more quantitative, saying that, well, in case of black holes, uh, it doesn't seem to be, there doesn't seem to be any, any scope for any wiggles, et cetera, because it seems that the, you know, there are exact monotonicity conditions that you can get in, in black holes. So in, in particular, if you use the Rachelder equation, then by using the null energy condition, uh, you can show that, so Hawking showed that the local area of a black hole horizon uh, never decreases. So it's a non-decreasing quantity and um, so, uh, so as long as you, you, know, you satisfy these rather general conditions of uh, you know, the energy condition of, uh, you know, and use right the equation, which is a simple con consequence uh, of um, Einstein's equations. So you can show that the black hole area actually never decreases. Okay. So we uh, therefore would like to ask, do we have an understanding of, uh, on the other hand, you know, because of the advent of ADS CFT, uh, we uh, know as we're going to um, stay in a couple of slides that the, the question of black hole formation does lead to, it's not only it's similar, but it, it's actually equivalent. They're, 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 they're two descriptions of the same thing. Okay, thermalization in the boundary theory is the same as black hole formation in the bulk. And therefore, if thermalization in the boundary theory has, an, has a simple explanation in terms of pure state going to pure state, but looking like a mixed state, uh, so um, do we have a similar understanding? And it seems that from all these rigorous theorems of um, uh, like Hawking's theorem, it seems that there is, a, there, is, there, is, there is some kind of a conflict between these rigorous theorems and the, uh, what we expect. Uh, that there should be some kind of a wiggly behavior, so some uh, small violations of uh, non-monotonicity, uh, monotonicity, and where are they? So there's a question, where are the wiggles in general relativity? Okay, so if we, so, uh, so Hawking's theorem uh, should actually have looked like this rather than saying that the area should never decrease. It should say that, well, the area uh, the area function, some kind of a, a statistical mechanics uh, function, which uh, can have small wiggles around some um, largely monotonic behavior, but wiggles like this, and uh, then uh, indeed large departures, okay, in which the area really decreases and um, goes on. So in fact, it, it's long been very difficult to address these questions and you know match the behavior between um, between statistical mechanics and gravity uh, uh, for for some time. But after the uh, you know advent of the SYK model, uh, it's uh, been possible to address these uh, these questions about wiggles in thing and uh, the you know violations of uh, monotonicity. And uh, you know the like an area decrease 
examples where it decreases since have been possible uh, due to some uh, very, very interesting work due to Kurkulu and Maldesana, which we're going to explain a little bit, and also about you know, black hole formation um, in, in that little model. But before that, uh, here's the plan of the talk. Uh, Maybe uh, sh shortly uh, a question before um, is this error law. I mean, if I have the thermal radiation of uh, of the black hole, the the area does decrease, uh, isn't it? So, do we assume a classical uh, black hole or? Yeah. So what? Um, sorry, I I I I I missed your sentence. Uh, sorry, say it again. So, yeah. so if uh, the black hole radiates, uh, it uh, loses uh, mass. Good, good, good. Very good point. No, no. This is without going to uh, the, the level of um, radiation. So this is at the level of the uh, classical uh, thing itself. Yeah. Basically, we're going to uh, show that um, you know you can you can introduce uh, perturbations in the in the system. So it's a it. To say that, okay, so yeah, it did. So we we will actually violate one of the. Uh, so it's not like it's a violation of the area theorem, really, but we'll show that you know it is uh, possible to violate the null energy uh, condition in some models, and therefore you can have uh, area decrease theorem. So it's not it's not like a you know a given. That uh, in a statmic system, which is uh, which is a uh, system with a dual to uh, gravity, okay, the uh, the null energy condition or the average null energy condition is always guaranteed. So, uh, in in other words, the the answer to your question is that no, I'm not uh, talking about the uh, evaporation uh, and therefore the decrease of the area. So it's at the at the leading order. All right, so let me, let me, um, so this is my, my, the plan of the talk. So first I'm going to uh, uh, give some quantitative uh, idea about how uh, these calculations are done, uh, you know, and the definition of local thermalization and integrable models and uh, generalized Gibbs ensemble, uh, about which a question was asked before, and uh, outline of some of the previous results and then um, I will des describe this part three and four in some detail. So the part three will be about thermalization in cold atoms, fermionic formulation, and hydrodynamic uh, hydrodynamics. So the, this would be good fun. Okay, this is pure statistical mechanics. It's not nothing to do with ADS CFT, uh, but there will be some uh, you know the the, the the problem with the shock waves. Which we will be able to solve, and which you know do not does not allow you to go beyond a certain time because your equations become singular. But we will use some lessons that we have learned many years ago from the studies of C equal to one, and which allow us to go beyond that time and show that things do thermalize in these cold atom systems, which are described by fermions. So that's, that's, that's part one, that's pure statistical mechanics. And part two is the, the SYK model uh, where we would talk about the pure states and, uh, and the trick of uh, Kurkulu and uh, Maldasena in which uh, you know, the uh, black holes can be unformed, horizons can go away um, by introducing certain uh, perturbations uh, to, to an SYK model. And uh, then we will do a second quench in which uh, the uh, horizons uh, will be formed uh, back again. And in fact, we will find some chop to criticality besides showing explicitly that thermalization uh, does happen you know, and, and power law behavior of uh, correlation functions become exponential um, behaviors, which, is, uh, which are telltale signs of uh, you know, thermalization having happened. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, models of evaporation, uh, which if I have time. So I will certainly probably not have time for that, but um, let's see. All right, so uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I should have uh, paused for uh, questions even before. Um, 
Were, were there any questions about the general stuff? But it's too general. So perhaps it's only when I um, uh, go to specifics that uh, uh, you will have some questions. All right. So this is, uh, so I guess, uh, you know, the, uh, everybody knows um, that the non-equilibrium system, one, one very popular way of generating uh, a non-equilibrium state uh, is by doing quantum quench. So you, you introduce, uh, so this is a spin model as a quantum field theory. You introduce some uh, time, uh, time dependence uh, uh, to a parameter. Uh, you assign some time dependence to parameter in the Hamiltonian um, or in the Lagrangian. So the, here the, it's a time dependent mass. Here is a time dependent magnetic field. And um, the uh, Euclidean principle, uh, you know, introduced time dependences to these, these couplings as well. Uh, so, but th this one is, is particularly popular. And um, so what you do is, is, a, is a sharp time dependence um, in, in the sense that it had some initial value. So that some initial value goes uh, to a final value, uh, you know, suddenly. So the general picture is like you have some, you have some coupling constant which goes from G naught to G1. Um, it can go gently as well. So that, that also, uh, there's a detailed theory of that, uh, you know, uh, called the kibble zurich uh, uh, mechanism. And uh, the, but we will uh, mainly talk about sharp changes here. So G naught uh, just uh, changes like a theta function from G naught to G1. And we are also going to talk mainly about situations um, uh, well, not, not, not quite all the time. Okay, so there are, so in the next two slides we're talking about, uh, we're, we're going to talk about situations in which um, uh, we'll, we'll give examples of uh, this uh, final coupling G1, which makes the theory conformal. Okay, so like M square of T, so M, it, uh, it go, starts with an M naught and goes to zero mass. So the final uh, post quench system is given by a conformal Hamiltonian. Okay, so the, um, and typically one uh, starts with the ground state of the old Hamiltonian. And uh, then if one does a sudden quench, then by standard rules of quantum mechanics, the wave function does not have a time to change. And therefore the, the ground state of the old Hamiltonian uh, is your post quench state here. And, <clears throat> but that's the ground state of the old Hamiltonian and therefore it's not the ground state of, uh, uh, of the final Hamiltonian. And in fact, it's a fairly excited state of the final Hamiltonian in which the amount of excitation, uh, you know, uh, is roughly given by the, by, the, uh, by the mass gap of the original theory. And there's a particular ansatz for post quench conformal uh, states which is called the Cardi, uh, Calabrese Cardi ansatz, which has been found very uh, useful in, in the discussions of post quench behavior, uh, which we have worked on. And um, you know, we, we found that uh, in, in specific situations like the mass quench, uh, one can generalize this ansatz to some generalized uh, uh, in a Calabrese Cardi state, uh, which summarizes not to uh, uh, not to a thermal behavior, uh, equilibrium is not to a thermal behavior, but to a behavior which is akin to uh, generalized Gibson some way. So, uh, so here are the, uh, so okay, so here it is. So now there's some formalism here, which is that let us say that psi naught is my post point state. Uh, okay, so this uh, is the time, so that's at time t equal to zero. I have assumed I have assumed that this, this time here is t equal to zero and the state here is psi naught. Okay, and the, um, so the, at, at time t, it, it's given by clearly this, where h out is the final Hamiltonian. And the, the full uh, density matrix of the system, okay, it's a, it's a pure state density matrix. Okay, so it's given by this projection operator here, as, as it's written here. Projection operator psi t, psi t ket, psi t bra. That's the projection operator. And uh, now you consider a sub area of the system, okay, called A. It's a physical sub area, sub area, uh, sub, uh, area uh, sub region in real space uh, called A, and the rest of it we'll call B. Okay, so the reduced density matrix of the 
uh, of the subregion. Uh, that's a function of time mm, uh, uh, because the what you do is the partial trace with respect to the uh, region B. And we, we were assuming here that, uh, you know, the, the system, uh, like a conformal field theory, uh, sorry, excuse me, like a quantum field theory system as a, or a spin system, uh, is the, the Hilbert, total Hilbert space is factorizable into a Hilbert space of A and a Hilbert space of B. So what you do here is to take the, take the full uh, trace here and do uh, in the partial trace. And what you get here is the time dependent uh, reduced density matrix. And uh, it's easy to uh, see that if you have operators, if your observables of interest are all in the region A, then um, their expectation values are just given by uh, entirely some, some operation in region A itself. So you take row A and uh, take the uh, average of uh, your observables uh, with respect to this. Uh, this. So you, 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 you do this trace remaining in the region A. And uh, so uh, all your uh, local observables uh, defined as their support being within A, uh, okay, uh, their, uh, their information is uh, completely uh, encapsulated in this uh, uh, thermal density, uh, excuse me, in this uh, time dependent uh, reduced density matrix. And the local thermalization would uh, be the following statement that this, uh, if you consider um, a reduced density matrix starting from not from, from a pure state, but from a, a thermal state, and take a partial trace here, then uh, let's call that rho A of beta. Then if rho A of T goes to rho A of beta in, uh, at, um, in uh, asymptotically in the time, then the, uh, um, this would be called the uh, thermalization of the ordinary kind in which it goes to thermal state. And uh, when you have integral models, then uh, your uh, uh, conserved quantity is not only energy, but uh, you have the other, uh, other charges, uh, conserved charges, an infinite number of other charges. And the, you can introduce the corresponding uh, chemical potentials. Chemical potential corresponding to the uh, energy would be, I mean, the conjugate variable corresponding to energy would be beta and the uh, corresponding to other charges that I have called here beta mu i. And uh, so just like you constructed rho A of beta, you can similarly construct the reduced density matrix of the, this is called the generalized Gibbs ensemble. And uh, so the, for integral uh, uh, systems, uh, we, 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 are able to, we were able to prove in, in some rather general class of systems in one plus one dimensional conformal field theory uh, that uh, this, both these things uh, actually occur and we found the relaxation rates as well. So that will come next. So in one plus one dimensional quantum field theory with quantum quench leading to a CFT uh, where the quench uh, coupling was an irrelevant coupling and it, I take the system to, uh, um, to a, a conformal point. Equilibration is observed uh, and it also works for integral CFTs. So this is what I, I said in the previous thing. And we also found uh, the relaxation rates is that exponential approaches to um, exponential decays to this, to this value here. And uh, it's given by gamma of beta is, uh, so which is some function which is uh, basically uh, inverse beta, so it uh, if uh, so there, there's a, there's a particular formula that we we found, uh, and similarly if uh, this was an integrable system, so we we took a particular examples of W infinity algebra and uh, the relaxation uh, exponents here, where functions of the these uh, conserved uh, quantities. All right, so, and in fact, uh, we, we found that the, um, so this is, uh, you know, this also the, done uh, by John Cardi um, independently uh, of us. Uh, so this is our paper, uh, 2015, December, I believe, and Cardi's 2016, June or something. All right, so, um, and, and, and we also found uh, in, in some of these uh, systems, uh, you know, there's a holographic interpretation of this, even this integral uh, uh, equilibriums, these are given by um, 
uh, the, these are black holes which indeed have uh, infinite number of uh, uh, conserved charges. So these are called the higher spin black holes in the context. Of, so this is ADS3 CFT2, two, uh, two dimensional CFT. So therefore the dual is ADS3 and uh, you do have these black holes with infinite, infinite number of charges and infinite number of chemical potentials. And we actually matched these uh, uh, relaxation rates that we, we found from the um, quench calculations in, in, the, in the statmic quench calculation to the quasi-normal decay rates of the high spin and black holes. Okay, so in three dimensions, it also happens that, you know, you can actually match them, uh, in, but in, in higher dimensions, you know, you have um, your, uh, the Tuft coupling parameter. So you, you typically get these relaxation rates only at weak Tuft coupling from the, from the field theory calculation and the uh, quasi-normal uh, decay rates, however, at uh, large Tuft coupling. So you cannot exactly match them, but you can perhaps uh, compare some qualitative behavior. But here in ADS3, mm, you can, uh, these, these, the numbers that come out here are exactly matched. Now, higher dimensions, so we, we found recently some interesting result about the um, nature of relaxation to uh, uh, equilibrium in, in case of, let us say, free field theories with time dependent mass. So you do a mass quench in free field theories. And what you find, uh, again, when the mass goes to zero, what you find is that the, um, the expectation values of operators, they relax uh, by uh, an exponential if uh, the spin number of spatial dimensions is odd and they uh, relax by a power law when the number of spatial dimensions is even. Okay. We're still trying to find out uh, a simple explanation of uh, this fact, but uh, the fact is true. Okay, so now we come to the, um, the uh, first part of our talk. Uh, sorry. So before that, let me let me let me pause for a moment. So are there are there any questions of? Uh, so this this is something perhaps familiar to you guys. Uh, so not 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 this slide, but the previous slide. So, uh, Gautam, what is the speciality in the dimension here that the behavior changes in both the cases in the last slide? Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's uh, that's a good uh, point. So first of all, if the d is odd, so uh, that includes one. And so in one plus one dimensional um, uh, CFT, we indeed found this behavior, the exponential behavior as in the previous uh, thing. So it, here it is, okay. So, but when, when we went to two plus one, four plus one, and uh, theoretically, you know, you can talk about four plus one, six plus one and so on and so forth. We found that in all of these things in which the number of uh, space dimensions is uh, even, uh, okay, the, this, uh, it goes like, uh, uh, a power law. Uh, this has some mathematical similarity to this uh, issue of uh, massless scalar fields. Uh, you know, sort of um, uh, uh, the their their causal Green's function um, in in, in um, odd number of space dimensions. Okay, the massless. Uh, uh, um, uh, the, for massless fields, the causal uh, Green's function, it just uh, goes and, and sticks to, so let me see how, the, how that goes. So, the, the, so let us say this is the future light cone. Okay. And you have the, the support of the Green's function exactly on this. This is what happens for odd number of spatial dimension. On the other hand, the, uh, mm, in, in, in even number of spatial dimensions, you know, it actually goes in a little bit. Of course, in no dimension can it go out. That's out. That's not allowed by causality. But whether it comes in a little bit inside or sticks to the light cone itself, that depends on the number of spatial dimensions. Okay. So this, uh, this uh, behavior uh, is true for uh, massless fields. And the, the mathematical uh, formulas that go into proving this statement, okay, uh, and the mathematical formulas that go into our calculations are similar, but uh, it would be great to uh, be able to directly um, uh, sort of uh, see a little more that if that happens, it, this must happen because of, not because of a whole bunch of 
formulas using Bessel functions and stuff, but uh, because of some more uh, let's see, physics. All right. So um, yeah. So any any other question? If you guys have any other question, ask Gautam. I have a question from one of your previous slides where you explained quantum flange and showed the variation of the Kapna constants. Yeah, can mm -hmm. you speak a bit loudly? I yeah, have I, a question. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I have a question from the slide. Um, it's interesting that uh, you sh showed the variation of coupling constant and use it as sort of a parameter. Mm -hmm. um, how uh, this is a this might be a very naive question, but how general is this coupling constant? Like we can use uh, a QCD coupling constant, we could use a QED coupling constant. How general is this? You can take um, any uh, of the coupling constants in D. Um, so uh, it might make. Uh, uh, you know your life complicated in doing the calculation, but in principle, you can take. So, in fact, uh, people don't even uh, you know uh, talk in this language. People uh, talk in more general terms that you start with some h naught, and you introduce some time dependence to the Hamiltonian, and you end up with h one. Okay. So any 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 time dependence here um, will do. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, you, you know the I, this, the idea is the following. So the, the best best is to think of. Uh, um, okay, let let let, let me see, say a few points which may be uh, useful to. Um, let us say that you make this um, change very slow. Okay, very slow. Then. Uh, you know, you start with the ground state, and in the limit of very slow uh, change, that's the adiabatic limit, then the ground state will actually go to the new ground state also. Yes. Okay, so that's the, that's the adiabatic theorem. But the faster you are, the, the faster you make this change, the, the, you know, the further and further away you are from the ground state of the new system. Okay. So for a very uh, you know sharp change, a sudden change, okay. you are um, actually at a very excited uh, state. And in fact, for a single parameter uh, quench protocol, this is called a single parameter quench protocol, like G naught. Okay, the 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 this guy is roughly speaking at uh, at some excitation. Uh, you know, so there's, there's a ground state. So the ground state remains the ground state of the old system. And is is very different from the ground state of the new system. How different is it? Is basically, roughly speaking, the uh, maximum energy of some quantum, quanta, uh, in in this uh, in uh, in this state, is given by the mass gap of the original uh, state. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this uh, statement can be made with respect to any coupling constant that you uh, that you wish to talk about. So. It, if it is a single, uh, it's a single coupling constant. So then, there, that's to say, if there's a single mass scale, uh, will characterize the system. And uh, you know, Calabrese and Cardi had this ansatz that so the so the Calabrese Cardi ansatz would have been that e to the power minus h final so that is h out divided by the mass gap times some times some uh, state which respects conformal invariance. Okay, so these things are called boundary states. Okay, so there's a lot there's a lot of uh, you know background to this, but I'm I'm just saying that you know this is a very general concept, and where this mass uh, m naught the mass gap is uh, just generated from the single coupling constant that's uh, that's there in the beginning. Mm -hmm. and that single question. Be yes. My question was primarily from the perspective of heavy ion collisions. So in heavy ion collisions, I don't think it's the adiabatic limit because the region of the duration of time from uh, the, the time of the collisions and the freeze out, mm -hmm. and at least when the hypothetical quark gluon plasma is formed is not certainly not in the adiabatic limit. Right. So it's, 
has there ever any work been done with respect oh, yeah, to that yeah, specifically? Yeah, I, I should say that this is in the in the extreme non elevated view. So this is the this is what is called the sudden approximation. So, ooh, gosh. Anyway, so this uh, so what what I talked about here is the sudden limit. So the sudden limit is very well studied. The sudden limit of quench of quantum quench. That is very well studied. Um, of course, uh, that is very well studied uh, in the one plus one dimensional context. And uh, if the final state, uh, a, a final system uh, is a conformal uh, system, but uh, in the situation that you are talking about, like in Rick and so on, yes, it is, um, yeah, I mean, there are, there are, there's a lot of literature about uh, you know thermalization um, or the evidences of thermalization starting from uh, starting from you know your heavy ion collision whether the um, yeah that that's that's a, that's a fascinating area mm, uh, i mean we can we can talk about that uh, offline but uh, it, it's a much harder it's a much harder uh, area to Hello, this is Sudhakar. I have a question. Yeah, hi, Sudhakar. Hi. Uh, can you go? Can you go to the uh, place where you are showing about the light cone behavior? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, here. So the, my question is that: Is this observation true only for massless scalar field, or it can be any other field? No, no, massless. Massless, massless scalar field or any other field? Um. Uh, I believe that it's also true for massless fermions. Yeah. Now, for example, if I take photon, do yeah. I see the behavior in odd dimension photon and even dimension photon? The no, no. I, don't, no, I don't think I don't think photons uh, have this. No, I don't think photons have this. So, so uh, maybe it is not for the uh, spin one particle or vector particles, etc. Right? Well, yeah. Let me see. Just let me see. Why do I know what? Photons behavior. Uh, yeah, photons do have the additional, uh, you know, subtleties about, um, you know, this uh, the projection. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so. On. so yeah. Yeah. Rather than saying that uh, the photons don't have this behavior, let me say that I don't remember at the moment. Okay. Uh, then, then I will do it. Don't do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, but for massless scalar fields, it's a uh, uh, massless scalar fields. Yes, I remember reading your paper that this was observed. And right. uh, the other thing is that the second line, mm. that it goes as uh, inverse power to the power p. What does p means here? Oh, so 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 it is. If it is like the um, uh, so, if it's the okay. So in in case of free free field theories, okay, yeah. it's given by d minus two. Okay. Yeah. Right. And we are we are able to uh, actually see this situation, see the same behavior also with when uh, when couplings at large n, where. Mm -hmm. You have uh, you have a mean field description as you know, and uh, in that case also, if you take uh, you know the, if you if you tune your theory in such a way that your final mass uh, now by mass I mean the renormalized mass uh, zero, then you have the same behavior. Okay. So it's true for free theories, but it is also true for O-N theories, but which are you know um, uh, sort of. Um, uh, like free theories uh, because they have the mean field behavior. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. right. So let me um, let me now go to uh, you know the the first uh, uh, detailed uh, example of our um, talk today, which is uh, by the way, Shantan, how I, how am I doing with the time? You are perfect because you are a perfect teacher. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, so but uh, do do let me let me know. I mean, I don't want to. I will inform you. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to go on forever. Okay, so 
this is what the problem is. Okay, so I want to do um, you know some example, some specific example, just to give you an idea of how the statistical calculations are, are done, which also have some nice, interesting uh, challenge. Um, okay, of uh, development of shock fronts. Okay, and um, so the uh, some some of these features I have um, talked about elsewhere, but there are new. Uh, there are new uh, developments uh, that we have uh, uh, been able to, I mean, there are new things that we have been able to do. And um, so those people who have already uh, heard about uh, some of this before, so um, please excuse me. Okay, so, uh, um, so what's, what's the thing that, uh, you know, so in this ultra cold atom systems, um, you work with uh, bosonic uh, atoms, which are in the in in some particular limit of infinite uh, repulsion. So let's say this is a one-dimensional chain that I'm talking about. Uh, so this is called the Tonks limit, and not surprisingly, you can show that you know the these um, uh, both atoms with delta function repulsions are equivalent to uh, fermions. Okay, so the delta function uh, repulsions. Uh, uh, sort of simulate Pauli exclusion principle, so they become they become like fermions. So you uh, so instead of uh, working with the um, infinitely repelling uh, both atoms, you can uh, work with uh, uh, fermions, okay, free fermions. In uh, in some so if if it was like a um, uh, you know sort of ultra cold atom chain uh, in some confining potential which is created by some optical lattice. Uh, you can uh, sort of. If you don't uh, mind, may I ask a very simple question? What yeah. do you mean by cold atom? Because I am not aware of. I know this, but I don't know very much about it. Yeah. So, so basically, the point is that uh, you know you can you can um, talk about individual. Uh, so the you know the level of uh, uh, sort of um, uh, scientific. Uh, you know, and engineering, um, uh, you know, levels. Have, I mean, it's it's really a marvel that you can you can talk about you can uh, do quantum mechan you can observe an experiment with single levels of uh, quantum uh, uh, you know electrons in an atom, just a single level of uh, electrons in an atom. In the sense that, of course, the, there are deeper levels. There are deeper, deeper levels of the of the well, let us say, but you can you can tune your uh, things in so that it's it's like a, uh, it's like a single level that you're talking about. So this this is like um, you know the atomic version of a qubit, and then you have uh, you know you have a let us say uh, a one-dimensional lattice of such things. In each of these, there is a single, single level. And there is an overlap. Of course, there's a controllable overlap that is there. So this is like a, then, uh, you know, it's like a sigma one here and a sigma two, like single spin. And the, the overlap between these you know, so J sigma one, sigma two. This overlap is also uh, you can engineer it. Okay, so this is this is what you do in an uh, ultra cold atom system. You basically uh, generate as somebody, some theorist. Let us say, I mean, uh, you know, I'm I'm probably saying it in a very idealist uh, sense. It's very hard to do these things, but some theorist ri writes down uh, a spin chain Hamiltonian. Okay, and you say that to your ultra cold atom uh, experimentalist friend. And they generate that thing using using ultra cold temperatures and very uh, controllable uh, experimental conditions, but in such a way that and this lattice can be uh, it's it's not a lattice which uh, is is generated by um, so this periodic lattice can be generated just by a, a laser, okay, or or by a, a system of crisscrossed uh, lasers which uh, you know can. Um, Give rise to a two-dimensional lattice and so on. So, uh, anyway, so that it's, there's, a, there's some fascinating stuff which uh, has been happening for the last 
uh, 10 years, 15 years or something like that. And you can do all your, uh, uh, you know, uh, things that you have ever thought about, like in particular quantum quench and thermalization. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big way um, to really go ahead and do your quantum mechanics in, 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 a, in systems of nature. Mm, okay, rather than doing simulations. So these are not simulations, this is real stuff. Okay, okay so you can, you can do, you can do quantum, the quantum spin chains in your, uh, in your machines. So that's theory or simulation and you can do the real stuff. Okay, so there are, so in, in my papers there are, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm actually fascinated by this stuff. Uh, and in my, my papers there are uh, lots of uh, references of the experimental, those, those experimentalists are absolutely hats off to them. All right, so the, uh, so that's, 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 those are the cold atom systems. And what I said here is that, uh, you know, so you can have a Bose, uh, Bose system here and you can, you can take, the, take the limit in which there's no way that, um, uh, so, well, so let me say that I have already, let, uh, rather than repeating it, I say that, you know, it can be, uh, Described. So this is, the, this is actually the way I have just, uh, just, uh, given the example here is like um, a spin chain, but similarly you can have uh, 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 Fermi gas uh, in, in this uh, example. So that's, that's what uh, I would talk about. Uh, free, free fermions uh, on a line. Okay. So, and there can be some, uh, you know, confining uh, potential. So you, what you have here is the ground state. So this, this is what it is. So one of the quench, quantum quench experiments would be that you start with, uh, you know, a, a one dimensional Fermi gas uh, in a, let's say, uh, you know, harmonic oscillator potential. And you suddenly change the width of the harmonic oscillator. Potential. All these things can actually be done. Uh, in in cold atom systems, and um, you can uh, what what you would like to see is the behavior of what happens to the Fermi C of the original problem uh, after you release this uh, uh, after you change the confining potential from the red one to the green one. Okay, clearly uh, you know the the this this highlighted thing the yellow stuff is not the same as the Fermi C of what um, in, the, in the new potential is that's which is given by this uh, little green uh, horizontal line. So that's, that's what would have been the Fermi surface. But what you have here now is an excited state. So starting from excited state, what, why does it go? What sort of potential people consider delta function or something like that? No, the potentials, these are, these are potentials which, which are felt by all the atoms. So the delta function that I'm talking about the interaction potentials. Ah, okay. These are, these are potentials which are felt by every atom. So this is called an external. Okay. Okay. So all fermions which are now, now forget about everything that I have said here. Just think of the resultant uh, thing of this uh, stuff as the free fermions. Okay. So those of you who are uh, familiar with this, that from spin systems, you can actually go to uh, fermionic systems uh, like an Ising uh, spin chain Mm, you can go to a fermionic system by something called the Jordan Wigner transformation. So you can actually arrive at um, the uh, fermion, uh, uh, fermion description by in that, that, that way, or you can have, uh, you know, um, a Bose atoms which are uh, in this Tonks limit and uh, you get uh, three fermions. But so basically you have three fermions in one dimensions, but in a confining potential and uh, you can either uh, let go of the confining potential completely, put them in, in, a, in a free space, okay, in a box. So that's something that we'll do, or you change the width of the confining potential. Okay, let's go. So that's just, uh, what's the statement of the problem. So experiments in the number of ultra cold atom systems involve the following question. So we have non-interacting non uh, fermions are in infinitely repelling bosons, such as Tonks gas, which is suddenly released from a confining potential to free space typically modeled by a periodic box. It's not free space, meaning the really free infinite space, which we can't work with. So it's a periodic box. So we initially you were in a, in a, in a sort of confining potential, and then you, you are uh, releasing uh, the, the gas into some free space in a box, or uh, a different type of confining potential, as I say, k x square going to k prime x square. These are examples of quantum quench because the changes are done suddenly. 
the, the problem is to find the subsequent quantum evolution of the system. Uh, uh, if we started from the ground state, like the Fermi C, uh, <clears throat> now the exact treatment you can do. You can do the exact treatment because you know the system. And that requires uh, looking at the you know, slater determinant of uh, the single particle eigenstates and chasing the slater determinant through the time, time dependence and see what happens uh, to the final many body state. And you can find your um, various uh, observables uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, the state itself, it, this is complicated. And uh, except in certain cases, this can only be done numerically. We have done some, uh, uh, Takeshi and I have done some uh, numerical calculations and um, shown uh, that the, the large in, you know, in the large in system, how <clears throat> the, uh, the large n calculations uh, match the uh, you know uh, numerical calculations for n equal to uh, you know, 120 200 etc cetera, etc cetera. we'll we'll I'll, I'll show you some graph later later on so there, there's a, there's an exact way of doing it but it's complicated okay using bogoli work coefficients and so on on the other hand um, if you have a large number of fermions okay you might uh, want to use uh, you know uh, hydrodynamics okay so you look at the you know some some region x to delta x so so let us say here some this is your line in which the fermions are and you look at some x to x plus delta x and there are some number of fermions here here etc cetera, etc cetera. so in the limit of very large number of fermions, you might uh, be able to express that number by some rho x and its time dependence, rho x times delta x. That's the number that's there in this interval. Okay. So this is standard lambda literature stuff. And uh, uh, yeah. sorry, I have yeah. one more question. Can you just go back to your previous slide? Sure. Mm. Yeah. No, just where this k went to k prime. Yeah. Yes, so, yes. Uh, is it always that k prime has to be less than k? No, 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 no. K prime can be greater than uh, k also, and uh, in which case it would be sharper. Yeah. Good, good, good. Uh, the point I'm telling that if I want to connect it some physical system, right, and uh, try to remember my MSc days, what I meant by quenching. Yes. And always when we say quenching, basically there is a sudden decrease of the temperature of the system. Right? Right. So, yeah, remember about the days you are reading about studying about quenching and annealing. Yes, yes, yes. Of yes, some yes. samples. So the quenching always referred to suddenly we decrease the temperature. And uh, I can understand, connect it to physically like here. If I decrease the temperature, basically I'm going from one harmonic oscillator to other harmonic oscillator. Right. But in that case, I would have, I would have thought that decreasing temperature means it's like putting the atoms uh, away or even the electrons a little bit away from the nucleus of the atom mm. if I decrease the temperature. So I was thinking that then K prime has to be always less than K or better than K, one of those. Um, I can't really find out what it should be later than where. You are saying that it's true for both, way, right? Well, you can you can in principle talk about making it narrower or making yeah. it uh, making it flatter, but yeah. making it flatter is the one that uh, would correspond to what yes. I have been uh, talking about so far, indeed. And uh -huh. you know, as uh, as you can see, that the Fermi surface, the green Fermi surface, is lower than the uh, that uh, this thing. So this is this is indeed the kind of stuff uh, that I would do. But in principle, uh, you know, the uh, some uh, this has this has also been done. I mean, uh, you know, there are there are both kinds of quantum quenches available in the, in the literature. So in in places you do uh, this like that. So yeah. so from there we come down straight away, right? So yeah. that is, it will be some sort of uh, decreasing the temperature, I will say, even, even if you scale it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Then, yeah. Then, okay. so, even so, this 
be done. Yeah, that can be done. Okay, mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. So, and possibly this an example will not call it a quantum quench. No, this is also called a quantum quench. I mean, then in quantum quench, there is no, there is no, there is no restriction really. And let me tell you the funny, funny thing here is that if you start from the ground state here, okay, yeah. although because of the diagram, it looks like it's going to a lower, uh, a, you know, it's a, I, sorry, the, the, this, this initial state is a lower energy state than yes. this one. Yes. But actually, uh, you know, the, the point is that this, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this is an interesting, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so the, the point is that the zero in yeah. cannot be the same as out because this is sudden change right? yes. and the Hamiltonian yeah, is yeah. different. It's not but the same. But you yeah. see, there is no, there is no, sorry, it's not the zero out. And you see, there is no um, later, uh, there, there, is, there is no state which is, uh, uh, has less then, energy. Than the zero out, okay. out system, so it has the ground to be state excited. become the most possible excited state. Uh, so the old ground state, in indeed, is an excited state of the system. Okay. Although from the picture, it looks funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And picture, not only that, possibly, possibly, I will not get any other. Oh no, the other, other states can be still higher than that. Yeah, right? yeah. Indeed, yeah. In zero, zero in. Yeah. The energy of that. Huh. The energy according to the new Hamiltonian yeah. would clearly be uh, zero, and it would again be related to this mass gap. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah. But there will be no no states which has lower energy compared to the top one, right? Because the ground state has gone up to that. Even if there are other states, they will be still at higher level. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. So it it looks funny. It looks funny. It seems that zero in this state yeah. is lower than the you know ground state of this thing, but it cannot be. Okay, it is not a ground state, therefore it has no excited state. Thanks. Right. Could okay. I have a question here, please? Yes. So with uh, respect to the specific example, we are not really changing the potential. It's the same harmonic potential with just a different k. So how free are we to change uh, to uh, use a different potential? Oh. I, yeah, so you can you can this of course in, in experiments this have been done and, and uh, you have also you can also do kx square going to zero, but zero um, meaning that zero in a box. Okay, so from kx square you can go into box potential, and also I think we have uh, looked at um, you can you can do either way, you know you can do either way. Uh, so this this the the k prime less than k and k prime greater than k um, both have uh, been uh, looked at. Although I have looked at, I think by and large, this uh, flattening um, of uh, this. But as I, as I mentioned here, so um, no, so you can actually do a, 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 a hell of a lot of things. Certainly, k x square suddenly stopping k x square is possible. You just switch off the optical edges. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Let me go. So, uh, so now the point is that uh, you can do the usual Euler uh, hydrodynamics. Okay. So these are the Euler equations. Is the continuity equation? Is the Euler equation of motion? And uh, but what happens is that I'll I'll tell you the reason why it happens. First, let me go to some picture. Ah, huh, here. Yeah. See what happens is the following: that uh, if you look at the some fluid, okay. So what what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the um, describing the um, uh, describing the um, fermions, okay, in terms of uh, some fluid picture. And if you look at the phase space picture here, um, you know this is this is what the Fermi surface, uh, uh, not the Fermi surface, but uh, the Fermi surface is, uh, would be some flat thing. Here, this is I'm talking about uh, free uh, elect free fermions in a box. Okay, Fermi surface would have been some flat thing. Okay, but this is what my initial state is because of some quantum quench. Okay, some Fermi surface of the Fermi C of some other system has given me this. Let's say, 
now you see so this will be the generic thing okay it will not be a, a, a horizontal the the surface here the fluid profile will not be something horizontal now you see the higher fluid uh, uh, points okay they always move faster okay so soon enough a nice smooth uh, fluid profile like that would develop a fold you know would develop a fold so i'll i'll come to this thing some more but let, let me just tell you why this is. and and therefore uh, you know when it develops a fold the the density okay the density with respect to x the derivative of the density with respect to x develops a singularity so this becomes um, you know the rho as a function of x becomes vertical at some point and it develops a singularity okay so um, i'll i'll give you many examples of uh, that kind of a thing uh, later on but this is the reason why um, very uh, very early on uh, uh, you know the there are shock fronts which appear so this does happen so right now just uh, just me just believe me that this kind of things happen in the next in the next page i will give you some uh, show you some graphs that uh, it actually happens now attempts have been made to um, uh, make some phenomenological uh, corrections to the euler equation so uh, you know people have added some extra uh, pressure term uh, like this red thing here just to discourage um, large values of del rho del x okay but it has not solved the problem so one of my collaborators uh, manas was involved in uh, in one such works and i know from him that uh, you know such uh, such methods have uh, uh, not succeeded and uh, and for good reasons too because the the reason is elsewhere okay mm, for the failure of the uh, hydrodynamics which will which will come to all right so uh, so what happens is the following that suppose that you have some density profile okay <clears throat> which let us say is of this double humped thing at some time t t less okay so this is this is the initial time and then you can show that uh the so this this um, this dotted graph okay is the one that is done by the method of slater determinant that's the exact thing of course done numerically okay and uh, this uh, the solid curves are given by um uh, this hydrodynamics the modified hydrodynamics in which one is trying to avoid the singularity but see what happens so this t less is the initial profile t0 is the profile where this uh, rho x t has developed a sharp vertical cliff okay this is symmetric between left and right, uh, right. so it's it's developed some vertical cliff here and here as well and then from then on you see that the the the, the theoretical analysis becomes a haywire and it 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 develops this uh, uncontrolled fluctuations okay so it shows irregular behavior so this is what you call uh, the shock front because the shock has developed here and beyond you you cannot go beyond that that's the that was the problem so this is uh, damsky's um, paper of 2006 and i'll tell you what uh, what um, we should actually do the way we uh, um, avoid this problem so this is done by using the method of phase space hydrodynamics which was uh, developed in great detail um, in the context of uh, c equal to 1 uh, matrix model and um, i will explain what phase space hydrodynamics actually means and conventional hydrodynamics actually appears the the euler hydrodynamics as an approximation from phase space hydrodynamics but the approximation breaks down at the time of shock formation but it doesn't mean that the phase in the actual description of the system also breaks down it's the approximation that breaks down so if you go back to the original description you know the exact larger description of the system is in terms of phase space it's not in terms of coordinate space and that um, uh, no the, no problem happens there so phase space uh, hydrodynamics uh, remains valid at all times and can address long term evolution and equilibrium so here you go so just 
just a two slide um, thing of how it works out. Let us say that, uh, you know, you have n non-relativistic free fermions in one dimension uh, with Hamiltonian, single particle Hamiltonian like this. And, um, you know, this is some potential uh, V of X. It could be uh, this uh, you know, harmonic potential or some other stuff. And uh, gen this is the general theory. So you can, you know, you can write down a second quantized Fermi field in terms of the first quantized eigenfunctions. And uh, so this, the second quantized field satisfies the Dirac-like equation, and it also satisfies the const uh, constraint because at the n um, uh, non-relativistic free particles, and there is no particle creation. We're talking about uh, non-relativistic free fermions. So there is a conserved uh, particle number, and this is the equation of motion. Now, so you can, of course, uh, you know, talk about psi, psi dagger psi, which will be the density variable, but um, uh, Wigner, uh, you know, had found uh, um, um, a systematics of talking about phase-based density. So this is the Wigner phase-based distribution and um, built out of the second quantized Fermi field. So this is the second quantized Wigner phase-based distribution. Mm, this is some convolution of the uh, second quantized Fermi field. Uh, you can do the similar thing for the, um, you know, the uh, single one particle wave functions also. So there is a, there is a notion of one particle, uh, um, uh, say a Wigner phase phase distribution also in case of three particles. So this is the second quantized generalization of the original work of uh, Wigner. And uh, so you can, you can uh, look at these equations and um, show uh, that the, if, you, if you look at the expectation value of the second quantized uh, Wigner distribution operator in some W infinity coherent state. So now I'm, I'm uh, you know, talking, you, talking about concepts which I don't have time to explain. But the point is eventually you have some classical description in terms of some small u variable, this is a classical variable. So that's like the phase space distribution of this and uh, which uh, has, uh, uh, you know, somewhat uh, expected looking equation uh, if this was not, uh, if this was Poisson bracket, okay? So this guy, okay, is the phase space distribution uh, function and its derivative would be given by the Poisson bracket between H and U. It's not Poisson bracket because of N, finite, at finite N, it is not a Poisson bracket. At, at large N, it becomes a Poisson bracket. At finite N, it is given by, uh, you know, so some difference of star product, uh, which are given by some, some formula. All that we need to know for this talk is that this model bracket becomes a Poisson bracket um, at large N. And similarly, the, uh, the Pauli exclusion principle becomes this constraint uh, for this uh, U um, operator. It's U star U, the star product of U and U is U, okay? So the star product becomes a normal product also at large end, okay? And this is the, uh, the Fermian number constraint becomes this integral equation. So now you can talk about uh, some limit in which n goes to infinity. So n goes to infinity and h bar goes to zero such that n h bar is held fixed and in our normalization it is equal to one. So what you can do is that this h bar you can take to here. So this becomes n h bar equal to one and this becomes Poisson bracket in that limit also bracket, and this star goes away, so it becomes u squared is equal to u, okay? So this is what I have said in the uh, next uh, paper. So the equation of motion becomes just the standard equation of motion, Poisson bracket. Uh, time derivative is given by Poisson bracket, and uh, you get u squared equal to u, and uh, you have the area, uh, you have the area constraint. So the area uh, integral of this u is equal to one. Now u squared equal to u means that, you know, you can as at any given uh, phase point, phase space point xp, you can be either zero or one, okay? So the solutions of this um, u squared equal to u are given by what are called droplets. 
So there are regions in which u, u is equal to one and the rest of it u is equal to zero. So this is the uh, famous droplet picture of fermion hydrodynamics, okay? The phase space hydrodynamics of this becomes droplet picture. So this is phase space droplets. Now you can see right away that, okay, so before that, let me, let me tell you a little bit about, um, so can people see these equations? Okay, so let me, let, me, let me say this in pictures first. That this is a, this is some uh, portion of a droplet, okay? So the, the shaded region has u equal to one. And you, have, you draw a vertical line up from x, some given x. Um, and uh, this, let us say that this hits, this uh, strikes the boundary of the droplet at two places. I call them P, a, P minus and P plus. But that will depend on X, of course, and it will also depend on the time because the, the, the droplet will move around in time. We will uh, show you how later on. So from this picture, you can uh, right away say that, uh, okay, so in U is equal to one in the strip and U is outside. Uh, U is zero here and here elsewhere, okay? So therefore, at some particular x, uh, you know, the, the p has to be limited between, in, in order for u to be equal to, uh, so u is non-zero and in particular one, only when p is uh, greater than my p minus and uh, less than p plus. So using these facts, you can easily find out the density, the momentum density, et cetera, et cetera. These are just integrals over u itself uh, from p minus to p plus, so that's p plus minus p minus, or the when you talk about momentum density, so you have to integrate p into uh, u, so that's just integrating p between p minus p, p plus, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and you can do energy density and so on and so forth. Okay, so the equation of motion. So using these, you have the following formulas. Okay, that uh, your um, rho. is related to P plus minus P minus up to some constant. And the V, which is the velocity density that is related to um, the uh, P plus plus uh, P minus. I think there's a, sorry, sorry. I think there's a factor of two missing here. Uh, it, it should be, uh, it should be P plus plus P minus divided by two, yeah. Okay, and you can find out what the energy density is, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And the equation of motion of the U variable, they become equation of motion for the P plus and P minus variable. That's very easy to do. So U is given by some theta functions. When you uh, differentiate U, it hits the theta. It gives you some uh, deltas, blah, 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 and, and, and so on. They, they become localized equations. One is in terms of P plus and the other one is in terms of P minus. When you take the minus uh, combination, yeah. Is it something to do with mean field theory or something like that? Um, it is just phase space hydrodynamic. You, you may say that, you know, it is, uh, yeah, it, uh, it's, uh, I mean, what's the idea? The idea is the following, that the semi-classical description of a fermionic configuration is the following. You think of constructing, you know, you, you, you think of taking a, a, you know, your phase space and draw cells in them. Okay. Draw cells of size age bar. Okay. Now, Fermi Pauli exclusion principle says that a fermion configuration can be described by saying that either a fermion is here or not there, or in some other place, it's here or not there. So that's all we're doing, okay? So there's a region, there are, there are regions in which, and, and uh, you can show by, uh, you know, typical examples that the, all the filled cells are basically in some uh, adjoining places, and that this is what uh, the picture of the Fermi C, Fermi C is in, um, in the phase space. So in the, in the phase space, so 
let's say with an x square potential this is how the you know this is how the energy surfaces are and the last energy surface which is up to which it is filled is the fermi surface and uh, you know essentially you can you can uh, this is this is this is the picture of your fermi c but uh, the the basic idea is that there is a there is one quantum state per uh, per square in the phase space of size h bar that's all that we been said here okay and um, you can you can relate this to mean field thomas fermi and so on of course okay but uh, essentially is wkb okay it's actually related to wkb approximation and um, uh, one can one can rigorously derive this uh, you know this phase space um, hydrodynamics method for uh, high enough energy states of the system and for large n uh, that's that's quite enough okay so uh, you know un unfortunately i don't have time to say it. so some of the things you have to uh, trust me me on faith mm, uh, so if you take the minus uh, of these two equations and you get the continuity equation if you take the plus then you get the equation of motion so what i'm trying to say here is that from the droplet picture if the droplet picture is what is called quadratic that the vertical line uh intersects the boundary of the droplet in two places then you can derive the conventional hydrodynamic equation that's all you have to take from me here okay now let's go back to so this is what is a, called a quadratic droplet in which you have just been p minus or p plus but for reasons i have explained before that um you know the the uh, uh, the the regions of the fluid which are at higher greater heights they move faster they move faster and as a result soon enough they develop this fold so this this guy will develop this fold and when it develops a fold you can show that the um, you know the del rho del x uh, becomes so first of all you see that the quadratic approximation uh, is is gone okay because the vertical line uh, intersects the boundary of the droplet is four places so it's not p plus p minus anymore okay so you can't have the same derivation of the euler uh, hydrodynamics equations as you had before and um, in fact you can also show that when uh, folds appear in phase space then uh, the in 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 real space in coordinate space uh, rho of x becomes singular okay that that all is easy to show and is there written in our paper so but there's nothing nothing bad about a fold in phase space it's all smooth and nice nothing goes uh, singular and so on and so forth and we'll find that there is in fact so therefore it's a it's a coordinate artifact it's an artifact of your choice of variables that you uh, you know decided to work in terms of density in in real space uh, instead of that you can uh, remain in phase space or do something even better so so this is uh, what uh, so that that better thing we will uh, explain in the next slide so I'll, i'll tell you what what you can actually do so these equations of motion uh, you know for the um, uh, so the equation of motion for the for the fluid can actually be obtained um, in um, understood in terms of equations of fluid particles okay so given an initial fluid profile like this okay you can go to a final um, uh, fluid profile okay by simply following each of the fluid points okay let us say you begin at the point xp go to some point x prime p prime by the single particle hamiltonian like this okay starting from at time t equal to 0 at x and p and whatever you get as a result of the solution of this equation of motion that's the your final x prime p prime so you do this map for every point uh, inside and on the boundary of uh, the original fluid profile wherever you uh, come here that's the final uh, thing of the fluid profile you can show that these equations um, are in fact equivalent to the equation of motion of the phase space density variable okay so but that the, yeah these brackets are poisson brackets these are all possible brackets yes these are all poisson brackets yes. so basically 
We have come from a semi-classical treatment by this way to describe the system in some large and limit is a classical system. Is this what you mean? That is correct. That is correct. Furthermore, uh, because it's a fermionic system, uh, you know, the, uh, it just becomes a um, single particle fluid motion. Okay. See, this, I, I still try to understand how do I define a fermion in phase space? Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, basically, um, uh, as I said, you know, the, the many fermion system can be thought of as simply, uh, yeah, so you implement Pauli exclusion principle by saying just this, that at phi each phase space cell, yeah. okay, from delta x, delta p equal to h bar, uh, yeah. there's only one possible fermion that, so that's all that the fermionic nature does for you. Besides that, so in fact, delta x, delta p, the h bar, we are saying uncertainty principle or Fermi or exclusion no, principle. Why, yeah, the, why mean, is the exclusion principle coming here? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what. In terms of functions. Yeah, so I'm saying that, um, you know, a phase space density, which uh -huh. we have um, introduced, yeah. a phase space density cannot be an exact uh, notion. Right. Yeah, that can be exact motion. Neither a phase space density we can say whether it's fermionic in nature or bosonic in nature, right? Exactly. So you cannot quite say that the you know the phase point is at x. But what you can say is that the phase point is at some delta x delta p cell around um, x e, which whose thing is you know square root of Within that cell, it will behave like a fermion, but the moment we that's take the, we that's go for this large n limit, it is becoming, we can't, at that time, the large n limit, we can't distinguish whether it's a fermion or boson. But exactly. when we go to the cell, we can exactly. say that. Okay. Yeah, exactly. You can, you can have some, uh, you can have some fun by actually looking at simple harmonic oscillator energy states and computing the, uh, uh, the Wigner phase space distribution. So what happens is that the Wigner phase space distribution in terms of the radius, so this is the oh, radial okay. variable. So large n, n equal to infinity limit is this. Yeah, okay. It just says okay. that it's up to some. But actually, it is, uh, you know. Oh, it, it, okay. Okay. I got it, yeah. Around that. Yeah, so and this, the size of the wiggles have to do with h bar. h bar here, uh, remember, is related to one upon n. Yes. yes. So that is what uh, it is. Okay. Yeah, that's a good, that's a, that's a very good question. <clears throat> now, um, good. So but once it is, so this is the this is the technique that we do, and the first thing is that we are able to go beyond the shock. Okay. So this is a particular example in which uh, you know the this is what this is where the um, uh, the Damsky's like uh, treatment would have failed, uh, but as you can see, that we can actually um, uh, continuously look at the phase space di distribution. It goes like this: is the this is this um, dotted line which is a fold and so on, and the phase space distribution. Sorry, the real space density distribution does have a vertical slope here, and it goes on. But you can just uh, compute it as a partial. Phase, partial integral with respect to, so this row of x everywhere is defined in terms of dp uxp at any time, okay? And this, we have, we have got a theory of this, which is, uh, and at every point, we don't try to do an equation of motion for rho x, an autonomous equation of rho of x, that would, that would be wrong. That is how the normal hydrodynamics fails. You solve the uh, problem of UXPT, and the problem of UXPT also is not solved by solving its uh, Poisson bracket equation of motion. Rather, you do fluid particle tracking. So doing this, we are actually able to solve this problem, go to large uh, times, and, and show that the distribution actually uh, indeed develops these folds, and the folds becomes like this very, uh, very small fingers. And um, so this, this is something that we call filamentation and equilibration. So there's a lot and lot of filament and then the limit of infinite times, okay? So the uh, phase space distribution actually is, um, the deep black is one 
and the white is zero. And in the middle, you have some uh, gray uh, density, phase space density, and this exactly matches this t equal to infinity behavior exactly matches with GGE. So for lack of time, I am not uh, going to uh, go through the mathematical details here. It's, uh, so let me just say the, the following facts. To begin with, okay, so this is how the, the calculation actually goes. So I have the uh, initial profile like this, okay? And the profiles are now characterized not by P plus of X and so on, but rather than X minus of P and X plus of P. Okay, this is just for uh, some simplicity. Now, so what I do here, that is, this is my initial profile, and I use the equation of motion. This is, sorry, this, I forgot to say that this is a free, uh, free particle, free fermions in a box. So momentum remains momentum, even with reflections. And X becomes like X plus PT, okay? up to the point when there is no reflection. If there is, there, it was not in a box, if it was in free space, then P would have become P. So that's what I'm doing. Wherever P and X are, I'm at, so the UXPT is given simply by X, uh, replacing X and P by their equations of motion. So X is X plus PT. So X I'm replacing by X plus PT. And P I'm replacing by P. So that's the equation of motion. That would have been in free space. But this is actually in a box. So as a result, you have to do an image sum. You have to do an image sum. So when you do all that carefully, you just, and compare this with the, um, what would have happened in a GGE, so generalized Gibson ensemble, you find that uh, this picture that I said in, in, in terms of pictures here, okay, this, this gray area exactly matches. Exactly means really exactly. Matches the, what you would have gotten in a generalized Gibson ensemble uh, UPQT. All right, so, um, ah, here, here is, so I, here is a little proof that indeed this uh, phase space hydrodynamics method um, matches up with the Slater determinant method. So the, the, this red dotted line is the uh, n equal to 120 um, situation. This is some uh, uh, numerical simulation that, uh, well, it's not numerical simulation, it's just mathematica. Okay, so handling up to n equal to 120, uh, we could do this using mathematica, the Slater determinants uh, up to, uh, you know, with the Bogoligo transformations and so on. It's hard, it takes time to probably, in those days, it took probably some, uh, uh, like two or three hours or something like that. I forgot. Um, and so then you, you get something, okay? And n equal to, so we also have done n equal to 200. Um, so you have to be careful about errors and stuff. Anyway, so this is n equal to infinity. There's a blue line, okay? As you can see that, uh, so I, I don't have the other given n's, but uh, as, you, as you keep growing your n, Mm, and uh, watch out for the uh, numerical errors, uh, then mm, you see that, uh, you know, the, uh, this hydrodynamic method, this blue, blue graph, uh, okay, very um, nicely reproduce the, um, the large N uh, situation. And not only that, what you get is that the, the, uh, this is some particular uh, time dependent quantity that we, we have plotted here. And what you see is that it, it does not go over to the thermal average. It goes over to the GG average, okay? So this is a telltale thing that there's an integrable system. It's other conserved quantities which you have to take into account. Okay, so then we found um, uh, this. So this is about equilibration. And then we, we found specific power law exponents. These are some uh, universal results that we found is that if the potential uh, is x to the power two m, it's released from that potential to a box, then uh, it's a power law. Uh, uh, so it uh, approaches the equilibrium value uh, with the power law like this, given in terms of M. And uh, if it goes from a, a box potential to a larger box, then it goes like one over T. And if it goes from cosine potential to a box, then it's given by T to the power minus three by two. 
So um, I cannot, I don't have time to go into the proofs of these things. And uh, we're able to uh, generalize, um, you know, so th this is the stuff that we are working on with um, uh, Satya Majumdar and Gregory Sher and Manus Kilkarni and uh, uh, Takeshi. Um, so the, the, the fact that, uh, you know, in two plus one dimensional fermions, you can have effectively some one plus one dimensional behavior appearing that's in the case of lowest Landau level of fermions. And um, that uh, is, uh, you know, sort of um, something uh, well known. And uh, however, uh, what happens is that the, uh, in, the, in the usual situations, these correspond to fermions, uh, which are all rotated, uh, which are all in, a, uh, in, a, in an R square um, potential. And uh, so this does not have distortion. So what we have looked at is some Coulomb like, uh, so we have looked at this. Okay, so let me tell you something. There's, there's something that is well known, perhaps. No, sorry, this is not so well known. The lowest Landau level phenomenon is well known. Okay, that, um, but this may not be so well known. That you have some, uh, you know, particles uh, in, in a, uh, you have some particles uh, which have a linear coupling to the angular momentum. Okay. Um, somewhat like magnetic field, and you have a harmonic potential. Okay, so much of the um, uh, you know, so this actually corresponds to uh, uh, like there is a, there is an effective uh, magnet. So this system and this system with a linear uh, you know coupling to the angular momentum, uh, they are identical. Okay, they are they are they are, they are just identical. So using that, we are able to um, uh, you know, go on. So I, I don't have time to. Pratham, Pratham, please go back to your previous, previous slide. Yeah. Uh, what is epsilon here corresponds to? Ah, so, the, so the point is that uh, this is something that uh, you, know, you are familiar with. I understand you have separated out these things. Yeah. Right. But this epsilon. Think, um, yeah. Yeah. So this epsilon. epsilon Ah, yeah, ah, is, ah, this, yeah, wherever the epsilon appears, I didn't understand actually. So this is related to that omega. Exactly. So the ah. point is that if the E B by two, okay, ah. it's just written here. Okay, okay, okay. E thank you. And the other point is that in this exactly the same exactly the same thing. Okay, good, good. So the what? XY Dirac bracket is becoming XY Poisson bracket, then you have brought in some F1, F2, what are those F1, F2? They are also related to omega? Ah, so F1, F2s are, are, the, are the following. So that, that remains the usual, uh, uh, usual things. You know, the, 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 you again have to, for the lowest Landau level, you have to oh. say that this is a sum of sum over squares and each yeah. square has to be zero. Okay. okay. So that the, the first, uh, first one gives you the first thing, F1, and yeah. the second one gives you okay. the F2. F2. So, and this this bracket x with f1 and uh, f2 with y those are poison bracket again yes yes absolutely so this is the familiar story to you so that uh, you know the xy dirac bracket uh, actually becomes something non zero so the poisson bracket between x and y of course is zero but now because it's a constraint system uh, uh, the, system, the bracket structure is also changing when we are comparing with classical system okay that's right. Exactly. Exactly. So it's a constraint compared with the unconstrained system. Yeah. yeah. Without the constraint, they would have just become the Dirac bracket would have the same as Poisson bracket. But right. because of this constraint now system, because so this structure is coming out. Okay. Good. Very good. Yeah. yeah. So, so this, now, this can all depend only in the two-dimensional case. Suppose I would have a three-dimensional system. What would I have done? <laughs> no, no. It no such luck. No such luck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so here, here also you can see that you know basically the first constraint more or less says that px is equal to y, yes, yes, y yes. and the second uh, thing also says basically x and y are uh, uh, canonical conjugates, and the yeah. Dirac actually sort of um, okay. uh, sort of makes the thing uh, proves that um, correctly. Okay, so so this is what this is what it is. But what, in addition to the usual thing, we are also able to 
um, add a Coulomb-like uh, potential, which in uh, which basically adds on to the uh, to the usual uh, centrifugal repulsion term, and it just makes uh, you know the Casimir's etc. all fractional. Okay, so this can this can all be done, and uh, so. Where you say Coulomb like this one by r square, going is one by r square. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somehow, somehow they call call this thing uh, uh, Coulomb. I mean, uh, it's Coulomb. <laughs> it's Coulomb force. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's really uh, you know like uh, the the reason why exact treatment. The, so we have done two things. We need to do exact treatment first of all. Okay. So that is what uh, these guys are great at, Satya and um, you know uh, Gregory Sher and, uh, and Manas, they have done the exact treatment of that. And the um, phase space hydrodynamics, Takeshi and I uh, mm -hmm. found that uh, many of the interesting features of this you can do, in particular the thermalization we are uh, trying to um, wrap up right now. See this poison, the bracket we have written R square by two bracket some sort of notice of theta. What is that theta here? I don't oh, know. Oh, is there? Is there? Yeah. Theta so that theta. So then that's my conclusion. Uh, you mean why I have used that strange theta there? Yeah. What is that? In this this first the r square by two bracket with that some curly theta is same as f r. What is curly theta means here? Yeah, I think curly theta is the same as theta. Okay. So. So the, basically, the point is that the you know the, the symplectic form yeah. uh, is uh, so by the by the previous uh, logic the simplest symplectic form is dx dp, but that yeah. I can write as uh, you know r dr d theta. So you are going over to r theta. Yeah. Right. That's, so that's yes, the same yes. as d of r square by two. Yeah. Times d theta. So r square by two and uh, theta. They are the complex conjugates. What happens in this case if you introduce uh, an additional uh, potential is, is that the um, uh, so this gets uh, slightly modified. This gets exactly this gets modified by some function. Okay, that function I have written here. So basically, that modified omega is that you are calling theta. No. No, I, I I think it may be just a typo um, because I'm not I, I I'm not putting one here. You see, so no, you are not putting one. In fact, you are not allowed to put one. Oh, so because the normal theta itself no. without the term here, it would have been one. With the gamma term, that I agree. That I agree. That I agree. Whether you take like r by two or r by theta, everything would have become one. That doesn't matter actually. But yeah. now. It, because of that term presence and yeah. this R square, that is bringing in extra R dependence. So mm. they are still having not one, but still a, some function of R. Yeah. Exactly. So as a result, has to be inverse of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As a result, inside the droplets earlier, you had one. Okay. Mm. U, U is equal to one. Now, basically, your H bar is changing. You know, your That's H bar is changing. Yeah. H bar to H bar times a F R. So as yeah. a result, your U now inside the droplets it becomes one over a for power. Fantastic. By using this, you can actually match with the uh, exact quantum mechanical, quantum mechanical treatment that mm -hmm. we have. We meaning that basically, you know, the our right. friends they have. I'm waiting for that to come to study it. What's yeah. happening? Yeah. Right, right, right. So the. Um, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll send you, of course. Yeah. When we... Right, so the conclusions is that the, um, you know, we, we were able to solve the problem of the shock fronts by using uh, things that we had learned earlier from C equal to one matrix model and we could prove thermalization, okay? And of course, uh, you know, there are finite n things which we could do here and so on, okay? Now, depending on how uh, people are, uh, doing, I can. Um, yes, I can see you have thirty-five minutes. Okay. Uh, no, don't, don't worry about time. Just continue. 
Okay, thank you. I, I will I will do that. Then. Until you're hungry and phone call comes from home, you continue. Are you at home in the office? Uh, no, no, I'm at home. I'm at home. Okay. I can, so, uh, uh, so uh, just give me one minute. I'll just heat up my coffee and come back. Just give me one second. Yeah, you can take five minutes break. Um, okay. So um, thank you. I'll, I'll just come back. मैं बेसी बकबक कर चुकी हूँ मैं जी बेसी बकबक कर चुकी हूँ हाँ हम हम जी थाने दी ची तुम्हारे लेक्चर Okay, I'm back. Thanks for giving me the break. So, uh, shall I continue? Hello? Uh, you please continue. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, good. So, this is part two. So, here I'm going to, uh, you know, go back to this issue of... Um, uh, the wiggles in uh, GR. So just to remind you, uh, because that's almost like uh, an hour and a half ago. So this is something that we would like to understand. That is there a pure state description of uh, horizon formation? And uh, in which case there should be a horizon unformation as well. So, you know, the area can... Uh, go uh, on an average, it, it will increase, but uh, it would also, so in other words, we would like to have um, a pure state description of a black hole horizon, okay? And uh, let us see, so this is just the customary uh, ADS-CFT picture. So what you have here is that on the uh, boundary conformal uh, field theory, there is some quantum quench that is happening. And as a result, um, uh, the, the geometry inside, uh, so, so this, this um, uh, state here is becoming a thermal state in all the sense, the sense that we have described before, okay? That it actually remains a pure state, but it masquerades as a thermal state uh, when we talk about local observables. 
Okay. On the other hand, uh, what seems to, what is claimed to happen inside is that the, uh, we have a black hole geometry that appears uh, inside, okay? So uh, this already seems like a little bit of a contradiction because uh, here it's only with respect to some local observables that we, in, in the boundary, okay? And the boundary is only with respect to some local observables that we seem to have um, you know, a thermal description on the other hand, uh, this here, it seems that you know, a black hole just has happened in the, in the geometry. So is it that you know, um, only some observables like you know, the gravity-like observables uh, which see a black hole inside? And if you look at you know, more fine-grained uh, objects, they do not see a black hole inside, okay? This, um, question the of course is very ambitious. We're not going to, uh, you know, quite uh, explain uh, how this might possibly happen. But um, we will uh, we will see how far we can go. Okay. So the uh, so this is the same picture again. That um, it seems that in gravity. Uh, you know, so this is this is the this is the uh, calculation that you can do by using Einstein's equation. This is something that has been done by um, Shantani and uh, Shiraz, uh, and also by uh, Larry Yaffe and uh, uh, and Chesler, um, uh, etc. So this is uh, the um, by their uh, geometry. So you have some null shell uh, going in from the boundary. And um, uh, before the null shell, you have ADS uh, vacuum, and after that, you have ADS black hole geometry. So it actually comes out of the, uh, you know, collapse calculation, okay, which corresponds to quantum quench in the boundary, because in the uh, in the boundary, this um, uh, releasing the null shell from the boundary is just that there is a uh, there is a sudden. Uh, change in the, mm, you know, the in the dilaton source or some other 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 thing which releases massless particles inside. Okay, so a, so this is what seems to be what quantum quench does. Okay, so now in uh, in order to be able to do that in n equal to four super m l series, it's, it's it's very hard because the gravity dual corresponds to strongly coupled super m l series, which is difficult to solve, and the strongly coupled uh, but SOIK model, uh, you know, this is such the B Kita F model, is uh, supposed to give you some, uh, you know, hit up on that. Is the the um, it's the simplest model of ADSC. Quantum mechanics here is zero plus one dimensional. And um, the, not only that, the strongly coupled SYK model is actually exactly solvable, okay? And uh, so that's a coupling constant, um, you know, this, uh, 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 so here in the SYK model, there's a coupling constant, which takes you to uh, this, uh, which when taken to uh, strong values, okay, gives you the interesting behavior and uh, it can actually be solved, okay? So large J theory, um, when J is very, very large, the, infinite, the limit of large J, uh, it can actually be solved in terms of some uh, theory called the Schwarzian theory. Thus, uh, uh, and, and gravity appears exactly there, okay? So the, uh, the strongly coupled uh, SYK and uh, gravity, they, they appear in the same region of parameter space and Mm, it's uh, both are described in terms of the so-called Schwarzian mode. So I'll just very briefly say, uh, so in addition to these pictures, you can also des describe some you know, finite N effects in, in these things. Uh, so I'll, I'll come to this uh, thing uh, later on. Okay. So uh, let's, instead of being completely unorganized, uh, in, uh, let, let's say this is the plan. Introduction we've already done SYK model. I'll review uh, very briefly the pure state construction of Kurkulu and Maldasena. This is an absolutely fantastic piece of work. 
uh, which gives you the, the you know the black hole bulk dual black hole or non black hole bulk duals and um, we will see that uh, you know you you can introduce some coupling into the theory uh, which needs to be uh, fine tuned and which uh, which uh, creates a certain sign which is uh, and and amounting to a violation of the area theorem Mm, of course, the area theorem is rigorously uh, derived. So the way to, uh, you know, violate the area thing is to say that it's uh, uh, the the uh, the sign of the potential actually uh, amounts to saying that the um, uh, null energy condition is uh, violated. So you are pumping energy out of the system, and uh, the um, area. Can uh, uh, black hole horizon can disappear, and um, the uh, the second uh, so that that's the first uh, quench that uh, they did uh, put and Maldacena, so the black hole horizon disappeared, and then we did a second quench on on that that system which didn't have a horizon, and uh, we turned the clock back, and we actually found black hole um, formation. So the black hole formation turns out to be not fine-tuned, um, and any uh, kind of, it's a, it's a robust uh, thing as you as you would expect. So if you do not fine-tune um, black hole forms, uh, just like if you do not fine-tune uh, like that Maxwell demon, like in that Lost Mitt uh, paradox that we talked about, then uh, you actually go towards a thermal equilibrium. So that's what does happen. However, if you do fine tune, then you can find some interesting critical transition to black hole. So this is uh, um, akin to what is called Choptrick uh, transition. And um, so we'll uh, hopefully and oh, this, this yeah. formation of black hole. This thing is this related to uh, gravitational collapse? Yes, yes, it is. Because this is Choptrick transition is appearing there. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, 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 exactly. It is related to gravitational collapse. Of course, you know the <clears throat> the we we can we can see we can see the this um, uh, some similarity to this null shell you know Vaidya uh, thing. Mm, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you, yes, it is it is indeed it is indeed similar to gravitational collapse. Uh, Gautam, the curiosity hmm. you are giving. First quench and then we go for a second quench and we found something else dynamically is happening. Yes. Uh, suppose my Hamiltonian, I will give multiple quench. Yes. Do yeah. I see, do I see the features of a black hole breathing? Yes. Correct. We can. What you can do is to uh, you know the horizons. Uh, can be formed, unformed, formed, unformed. Yeah, form, form, form. So this is what I meant by breathing. Yeah. So, so it's a dynamical way, which will be, of course, specified the way we have done it for two quenching mm. in the Hamiltonian. And we yeah. put many of them. And right. maybe we should study about the large, large number of quenchings, how these systems behave. And uh, does it correspond to complete collapse of the black hole? Or black hole has still life. Uh, maybe that maybe that will be an interesting issue to really look for. No, and uh, number of quenchings and take large and limit of that. What the fate of the black hole? That's my that's my curiosity and the question. Yeah, yeah, good point. So I'll I'll tell you. So, so there is there are some qualitative things which you can already say. Uh, uh -huh. You know whether finally there is a black hole horizon formed or not. That. Uh -huh. That depends on some simple uh, kinematics that you uh, that you can do. Um, I see. I see. So uh, yeah, so that that's the that's the great thing about the SOIK model. That the okay. formation okay. becomes a rather simple question. Um, yeah. But because uh, it puts ad hoc if I just introduce a second quench. But if you can do multiple quench and find out what the ultimate head of the black hole, and uh, that should give us more confidence that, that our the way we are approaching the black hole dynamics, uh, we are in the right direction or not. This is just a, this is a curiosity just to find out that since you are into it, yeah, have to have a yeah, look. That may be interesting to look at actually. Yeah. So, yeah, but uh, 
I should say that there's 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 one uh, statement which I said somewhat loosely. I think uh, mm. I shouldn't say you know the by doing quenches back and forth like that, you mm. can have you know black hole formation and uh, and unformation. That never happens because horizon is a global uh, behavior. Yeah, that's global, global, global thing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You can say that you know the 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 local behavior of the uh, of the of the horizon. Okay. Yeah. That can, uh, or more precisely, the local behavior of this boundary curve in this geometry, that's the more yeah. important point. That can be kept uh, changing. Uh, and uh, so you have tendencies. You know, you ah. can have tendencies towards black hole formation, tendencies towards black hole information. Oh. And so maybe it can even be um, uh, re uh, said in terms of apparent horizon. But the apparent, there yeah. is a horizon or not, that's one short question. After yeah. all that. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, it looks like whenever I will whenever I will decide to give the second quench, I will form a horizon at that time. Which mm. is it's unphysical, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, this uh, second quantize has to be um, more than the critical value. Yeah. Then yes. what happens is that the you know you didn't have horizon and you don't have horizon even after the quench and so yeah. on. You so have to make sure that you are like, part yeah. My worry is that suppose I will consider simple Schwarzschild black hole. Yeah. What it looks like at what time I give the second quench, I will decide what will be the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole. And uh, this is a bit uh, unhappy situation uh, unless I find a somewhere that will form. Again, it will not form after whatever I do after that, it's fixed. Yeah. It's becoming like Schwarzschild radius of the black hole is a time dependent. Um, I hope I'm, I'm able to clear, I'm able to convey to you what I'm talking. Oh, I see, I see what you mean. But actually, the plateau region, how, huh. long, how long you spend there, huh. actually doesn't, uh, doesn't matter. I it's see. About the amount of the change in, your, in some parameter that you do, that huh. matters. I see what you mean. No, no, no. When you do your uh, second quench, that uh, does not make a uh, that does not make a difference. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. So, and then uh, you know you can do some stratmic calculation also. That when the uh, black hole forms, you you can see that the you know the the change of a power law Green's function uh, becomes uh, change of power law decay. Uh, of a two-point function, it uh, changes to exponential decay, and um, okay, and 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 then you know there is uh, uh, okay. I, I would skip that thing because it's anyway ongoing, and uh, so that's about black hole evaporation. We have some uh, work on that by uh, uh, doing an SYK to bath calculation. Also. Anyway, let's go now. So this is the SYK model. The SYK model is some uh, one-dimensional fermion quantum mechanics with um, uh, many, many flavors um, of n, n flavors. And, and they have um, like all-to-all -all coupling. Like this, the coupling is uh, uh, random. It's taken out of a Gaussian uh, distribution. And uh, so at large n, and there's a mean field description in terms of the by of the uh, you know the, I can't even call call it color. Let me call it color. So color invariant um, uh, by by linear um, of this is non-local uh, because there is you might say that why didn't I look at psi i of tau one and psi i of tau one? That's because these are Majorana fermions and that object is trivial. Okay, so I of tau one, so I of tau two. Uh, this is some that, that would be something uh, that would not be an operator at all. And um, so, in order to have something non-trivial, some dynamical uh, object, you should take um, like a bilinear, bilocal meson kind of object, and that's what uh, is this G. And um, so, what you can show is that uh, after some amount of work. That the um, there is a nice description of the of the system in terms of so th this this J I J K L their average value is given by something called J, 
And if I take that j going to infinity limit, um, then the path integral can be written entirely in terms of the g variable. And the, um, it's, so the, this, this blue region, which corresponds to the IR, uh, uh, IR limit of the theory, uh, and the um, basically, uh, yeah, let, let, let me not go into all, all the details. This region is given by um, some, uh, some Goldstone modes, which uh, are actually not bilocal, but just local. So these are some particular deformations of this meson field, okay, at each end of tau one as well as tau two, and um, that Goldstone mode. Sorry? This, this, I'm missing something. This tau is the our real cosmic time, right? Tau is the this tau. Or, or it's, yeah, or this is another some parameter. Uh, so the so the the uh, I'll, I'll I'll tell you what you should. Uh, so this is the um, this is the time of this, and what I am looking at here is that you can think of this. So it's a quantum mechanical. Mm, object so this is equal to zero so tau, I'm I'm talking about Euclidean here that is why I'm using tau. Okay. Okay. So, so, yeah. so, so in H zero also all the sides you have at different sides i j k l all of them are at the same time same tau. Yes. Yes. Exactly. A tau equal to zero. In fact. So this okay. this is so, where h is h zero is written. And the corresponding action principle is given by this you are, action. You are considering a one-dimensional system, one-dimensional four Fermi interaction? No, zero plus one dimension, just quantum. Zero, zero dimension, yeah, so I mean zero dimension or yeah. one point in the one dimension, yeah, zero mm -hmm. dimension. Okay, good, good, good. And that is why the action becomes this one-dimensional action yeah, in yeah. which you have this, uh, this. But the point is, I don't understand then why are you going to path integral instead of it? Uh, I thought it should, be, it should, it should become path a quantum mechanical yeah. system. The path, path, path integral is to show the show the symmetry and the mm -hmm. Goldstone modes. Which let me come to that one. So now yeah. this is the this is the thing. So if you uh, basically the path integral tells you that there is basically uh, an action principle in terms of this bilocal variable. Okay. okay. And this action principle has a Mexican hat uh, structure, potential structure. I so see. where, what you do is that uh, if you start from some uh, original uh, equation uh, solution for G naught, hmm. then, uh, you know, then this, um, uh, this deformation hmm. would also be a solution. So that's, that's in the Goldstone direction. Okay. 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 And what is this, uh, this thing? It's basically like some F prime tau one to the power delta mm. times G naught and F prime tau two to the power delta. But this delta is like the, um, you know, the uh, anomalous dimension of the quarks of the, of the fermions at the two ends. Mm -hmm. So this, therefore, this is the only important degree of freedom, that F, okay, uh, which describes this Goldstone direction. And there is, of course, the other one as well. So this the one. Of, the quasar space of diffeomorphism and SL2 is still one dimensional? The, it's one function dimension. It's one function. One function, but it still only depends on only one parameter. Depends on one. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Where it's a it's a one function of one variable. Yes, okay. that's okay. right. So therefore, the Goldstone physics is given not in terms of the uh, you know a function of two variables, but one function of one variable. Okay. So and in fact, the action of that becomes that of the Schwarz field. Okay? okay. So this. This is, symmetry brings it down from two variable dependence to one variable time, and then the action becomes just this one. Yeah, okay. That's right. The symmetry and the energetics basically, you know, the there are also this non Goldstone directions. Okay. Yeah, now we are looking about once we go for deep slash SL2, we are inside on, on under this circle actually. 
yeah so the, the the point is that you know the other modes the orthogonal modes are uh, all active here but once you go to very very infrared low energy descriptions mm -hmm. there so here the the full uh, g tau 1 tau 2 is active all of these and here it's only f of tau okay that is i had limit there just then is from the scene okay that's right so and it's given by the Schwarzian mode, okay. And now I will show you that in the bulk dual, it's exactly given exactly by a single function of a single uh, time variable, okay. Uh, so let me not uh, get into. So there are uh, you know two possible bulk duals in both. You you have the same the more familiar one. So this is something that we had looked at polycogravity gravity um, that also has uh, you know this diff mod SL2 structure. And so does this. This is Jacob Teitelboim uh, gravity. In each one of them, uh, basically these are these are two-dimensional gravitational systems. So as you know, in two-dimensional gravitational system, there are no propagating bulk degrees of freedom of gravity. In fact, gravity has minus one degree of freedom. So you add in a dilaton to that in the uh, in the JT picture, and dilaton provides <laughs> plus one. So gravity plus dilaton has zero degrees of freedom. Yeah, you can say it that way. And um, so, so the only physical degrees of freedom are what are called the boundary gravitons or the large diffeomorphisms. So these are given by some, uh, a, you know, the, the large diffeomorphisms have this kind of structure uh, that it is. So these are these are these are basically um, the one-dimensional lower uh, counterpart of brown henot diffeomorphisms. Mm -hmm. And um, so this uh, this tau and z goes to some tau f and z f. It's uh, given by basically the um, uh, reparameterization of the time variable. So the reparameterization of the time variable at the boundary that is f of tau, and this f of tau also has exactly the um, action cost which is given by the Schwarzian. Okay, so let me say that um, yeah. So this is this is how. Under a uh, uh, large diffeomorphism, the metric changes okay, from, from the, this part, which is just the uh, ADS 2 point array, to uh, the, D, the GTT that uh, changes by this amount, and uh, which means that there is a, you know, uh, there is a genuine change that has happened to the, to the metric. Therefore, the large diffeomorphism uh, and we, uh, this is the last decomposition is that we do this. And uh, so anyway, this is again given by the Schwarzian and you have an exact match between the variables describing gravity and the variables describing SPC. Uh, these, these things are very lucky. These things don't happen in higher dimensions. That the variables describing these are to and so on and so forth. And excuse me, uh, Abhinash, put I, your. Uh, no, it's okay. Okay. So now the uh, various solutions. Okay, so the equation of motion of the Schwarzian theory is that the time derivative of the Schwarzian is equal to zero. There are solutions which correspond to thermal uh, solutions. Uh, and solutions which correspond to um, uh, so the uh, yeah so the solutions for f okay uh, every solution of f can be translated to some solution for the metric and um, similarly so there is a tan solution and there's a just a tau solution it corresponds to just plain ADS and this corresponds to ADS black hole all you have to do for a curiosity this uh, no, no, yeah. I mean, the, the previous but. Yes, is thermal SYK is your identification, or the SYK people that talked about that. It's identification, exactly. It's, identification. it's your identification, right? Oh no, 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 no. This is uh, the SYK. Of course, uh, have used it in a great, uh, great way in uh, doing the free energies and you know the thermodynamics of SYK uh, and matching it to the black hole thermodynamics. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Go ahead. No, no. So far, this is not. Our, I'll tell you when our work starts. So this is okay. this is a review of what is known. Okay. 
and uh, so that duality um, yeah so so let me let me tell you what uh, the the so there is a okay so there is of course this more complicated description of boundary diffeomorphism but there's a simple one okay uh, so this is this is the boundary diffeomorphism if you do these things complicated looking uh, objects then uh, your metric changes like that and uh, but uh, Malasena and um, Stanford uh, had used a uh, you know, rather uh, different and um, you know, simpler representation of large diffeomorphisms, which is the following. That you look at what happens uh, to uh, you know, a boundary curve, which is Z equal to delta. So that's the rigid boundary curve. That is the usual, usual way boundary is described in ADS-CFT, like in the GKBW prescription and so on. And then you do a large diffeomorphism, okay? So uh, as if the metric remains ADS Poincare, okay? And the boundary curve okay, changes, okay? So that's the point of view that you take, that you describe everything in terms of the original ADS Poincare coordinate, don't go anywhere else, but see what happens to the uh, boundary curve z equal to delta. So the shape of the boundary curve. This is like a, this is like a perturbation to the conformal tree theory. Now, in in both ways, it is a, like a perturbation to the conformal field theory. But okay. uh, this one, uh, so they, these are these are like the active and the passive rotation. You know, okay. so um, yeah, in 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 one way of the thinking about it, this green line, every yeah. point line is going somewhere else under your diffeomorphism. Green model. line is z equal to delta. Right. Green line is z equal to delta and the other one is the trans transformed z equal to delta. I, I see. Okay. 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 Right. okay. So, so the, um, so the, in fact, this is what, this is what the full equation is that um, the boundary curve. So earlier the boundary curve was just uh, given by z equal to delta and t is equal to t. Now that T, uh, so that is that is what in the, uh, so I, I should really call it, um, you know, the, um, uh, so, so anyway, so never mind equations. So this is what it is that this was, the green line was parameterized by Z equal to delta always, and the param parameter was T. Now it is some more complicated thing in which, which can be thought of as a, uh, parametric uh, representation of a relation between t tilde and z tilde. t tilde and z tilde will always be my coordinates of the original ADS uh, ADS uh, Poincare coordinates. Okay, and t and L, uh, t and z will be my uh, new uh, uh, coordinates. So anyway, just think of the wiggle. Okay, the wiggle of the boundary curve uh, retains information about f. Gautam, by doing this, are yeah. you actually violating that? Uh... Diffeomorphism slash SL2 symmetry you had, you have relaxed that. Otherwise, how do you go from Z equal to zero to Z equal to delta? No, no. So the, 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 the good, good point, good point, good point, good point. So the this, uh, so let me go, go to this one here. So this exercise here, okay, of the yeah. Goldstone, what it is saying is that the, you know, this going from G0 to GF, yeah. Okay. is actually not, um, uh, this is a transformation under which the physics of this guy and the physics of this guy is actually different. Okay. Although there's a Goldstone mode, wow. okay, the physics around G0 and the physics around GF are actually different. And it is precisely this motion that is also so let's say this would correspond to ads2 point carry yes so now and we have when, now we have yeah. tuned on the goldstone mode we are looking at yeah. physics in presence of the goldstone mode correct correct okay. and the goldstone mode can be either described in terms of this uh, somewhat more complicated things or it can be described in terms of the shape of the boundary curve okay mm -hmm. And now comes the main point, okay? This, it is the following. That let us say that my whole space-time is, you know, is, is this, um, is the diamond. And 
let us say my boundary curve somehow yeah. is a terminating boundary curve that it's it's, a, it's at a finite point here and it's also at a finite point at the horizon uh, sorry at, at at so that is to say the boundary curve actually terminates at the uh, z equal to zero okay, so this this blue line here is z equal to zero and my boundary curve actually intersects z equal to zero twice. Twice. Okay. What does it mean? That means that there are these points P, okay, uh, from which light rays go and hit this z equal to zero, but beyond the boundary curve. It's all reflected back. Okay. Yeah. So remember that the boundary curve is where the boundary theory, okay, the zero plus one dimensional CFT lives. Hmm. So this point, therefore, is unobservable to yeah. my observer of the Minkowski, I mean, sorry, the, my, my, my CFT observer. <clears throat> so therefore, I say that this is beyond the horizon. Yeah. And the horizon can be traced by drawing these, uh, this wedge, okay, starting from the two ends, the two, uh, you know, uh, uh, terminal points of the... Now, it can so happen <clears throat> that at t equal to zero, okay, the, which is this horizontal point, okay, the, from there on, I do some quantum quench or something like that, so that the physics of this, my f of t mm -hmm. okay, is changed and, and in the future. Okay? Mm -hmm. And instead of having this shape, it has the shape like in the middle. So the, in the past diagram, you are adjusting your quench so that they terminate. In the first diagram, to begin with, you know, ah. this is this is where, how a uh, thermal quench uh, so that that terminate because I don't see that there is any region. Why should it terminate? Oh, so that is like the that is how I I, I start with my um, original solution is is this? Yeah. In, okay. Uh, it is the thermal stuff. Yeah. Uh, instead of tan, now I'm talking about in Lorentzian, so it is tan hyperbolic. Okay. okay. So if they, it is that way, then you can work out the relation between t tilde and z tilde, and you can see that the relation between t tilde and z tilde is this. So you have manufactured a particular way so that starting from there it will terminate. Yeah. Then you are seeing the effect of the horizon in the second graph. Is that? That's is, so I okay. begin with a particular solution. This is called the thermal solution of the equation of motion of the Schwarzian theory, mm -hmm. and uh, thermal solution corresponds to this terminating boundary curve. Okay. okay. As you can see, I can solution choose. is true for any beta I can choose. Huh. That's right. That's right. That's right. The, beta, uh, the, 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 the thermal solution is characterized by a parameter uh, okay. which you can choose freely. So yes. When I, when I go to the temperature language, so mm. this is for any temperature, this Ft is related to beta like this is always true, right? That's right. Okay. For any, any value of beta, uh, f of t is a solution of the equation of motion. So that already defines actually z tilde and delta, then, then we are in the business. Okay. Right. So as you can see here, that z tilde equal to zero is possible to achieve at some finite value of t tilde. Okay. Because it's one minus something that will be zero at two places, t equal to plus minus something. Yeah. Okay. So, so that, that's what it is. And uh, now what is happened here in the same middle diagram is that uh, at t equal to zero, okay, so you begin with, this is what would have been the uh, geometry forever. Okay, if this is what, uh, this is what remained the solution. Now you, 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 you know, introduce some new dynamics into the system Huh. something else, so that the solution is actually something else starting from t equal to zero onwards. And that huh. something else is the behavior that it does never, it's, this boundary curve never terminates at zero. Never terminates, okay. okay. So it's uh, there, and the same point P now clearly can send light, which will be seen by the CFT yeah. observer. Okay, yeah. so no horizon. Huh. So this, this is what was done in the paper of Kuklu and Malasena. Hmm. And I'll tell you what, what modification that is. And uh, now the, uh, what we did was, was a second um, 
that uh, match that two k to the horizon. Okay, that's right. In which it had some behavior up to some point. Okay, then we. What I was trying to say, if I yeah. do multiple quenching, I yeah. can have a oscillation between no horizon and horizons. Almost like that. So what that that is to say that uh, you know you can you can go you can go like this. Yeah. And then come back and then miss the horizon and go back. I don't know the, what physically it means, but so I thought that somehow the usual be corresponds to black hole breathing mode. When I'm breathing in, I'm not a black hole. I'm breathing out. I'm a black hole. But simply speaking. So. <laughs> I, I think that I think that in that case, uh, you know, what will happen is that the the final point, the final yeah. guy, yeah. whether uh, whether it reaches uh, this place, that has to be tested with our choice of FT. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So although it has all this stuff here in the middle, okay, yeah. the, the final point will, yeah. will determine for you whether there is a horizon or not. Yes, yes, I agree. Yeah. Okay, right. Well. Right. So this is uh, this is the story, and uh, let me go. Let me go. So so this is in terms of the quantum mechanical variables. So, is, so what they do is to add some spin operator to the quantum mechanical picture. So let me actually go. Um, yeah. So this is an important slide in which um, you know basically the, I'll tell you a little bit about. So there are there are these pure states which are built. Out of eigenstates of the spin operator, so these are called the spin operators. They be really behave like sigma three in various uh, in various slots. Okay, so the the full algebra uh, is like an SO uh, you know n Clifford algebra uh, or SO 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 n Clifford algebra. Well, n is supposed to be an even number. I take the number of flavors. Uh, of uh, fermion to be uh, even. Uh, so there is an SON Clifford algebra like this. And uh, if you take these, uh, this combination of the Majorana fermions, then it becomes like a, a sigma three appearing in the kth slot. So th these are called the spin operators. And you can simultaneously diagonalize all of these SKs and they are given by the spin eigenvalues plus minus, plus minus, plus minus, et cetera. So these are the pure states which were used by Kukulu Maldasena. And uh, you can study the properties of these pure states, which are uh, deformed by, by some Hamiltonian evolution up to uh, some point to take it to, this is like a low energy projection on the um, pure states. And these guys, okay, these guys behave like a thermal state, um, with respect to a large number of variables. So these are like the pure microstates of the black hole. Okay, and uh, this is here the, the proof that if you take uh, some operators which, are, uh, which have the property of something called flip invariance, which I cannot go into, but a large number of such operators, they are like the metric operators. So they, in fact, cannot distinguish between one mm, uh, microstate and another microstate given by the spin label S. Okay, the, in the answer for the expectation value of some observables, the spin label S just disappears. As a result, you can replace this, of the, uh, this quantity by a sum over S. And as soon as you introduce a sum over S, that becomes like a thermal, uh, ec uh, ec Exactly, it becomes like a thermal average. And uh, so that becomes uh, this one. So it is possible in this theories to uh, construct exact microstates uh, which, uh, and, and a class of operators which cannot distinguish between these microstates and the thermal state. Okay, so these, um, this is uh, something now let me just, uh, okay, there's a whole bunch of stuff. So this is the kutlu maldasena uh, perturbation. Let me tell you what perturbation it means in terms of the Schwarzian mode. So in terms of the Schwarzian mode, so this is the original Schwarzian. And here there is some perturbation uh, in which I do time dependent stuff. So, so kutlu maldasena would start from a thermal state like this. 
and they uh, turn on um, an epsilon uh, uh, perturbation. And if it is beyond a certain critical value, which I will write in the next uh, page, then it, um, the, so th this, this state, as I, as I, as I proved here, that this, this state uh, with respect to, uh, you know, sort of large class of observables, this state behaves like a thermal state. And indeed, uh, so, so, but when you introduce this, uh, this kind of a thing, then um, if epsilon one is beyond a certain critical value, then this state does not uh, behave like a thermal state anymore. It's a very simple uh, thing to look at. So you go to the Liouville description in which uh, instead of the f variable, you go to f prime equal to e to the power phi. So it becomes like a sum of exponentials. And uh, so this is the main picture, okay? I can even stop after this, this one. So uh, this is your, and this is your potential, okay? That uh, e to the power phi was the original potential of the Schwarzian. This is Schwarzian theory. And this is kurklu maldasena perturbation, okay? Some epsilon times this thing. We are allowing uh, time dependence to this epsilon. So, um, so let me let me tell you how this this is the dynamics of the Schwarzian mode. Okay. So here uh, the Schwarzian mode is defined in terms of this phi by f prime is equal to e to the power phi. Okay. Let us say I don't have the uh, this um, uh, this term at all. Okay, then the potential is just a rising potential exponentially. So that's the epsilon equal to zero. Okay. And let us say my initial um, value of f is phi equal to zero, which is, uh, you know, which is here. Okay. And let me say that the energy is exactly uh, um, such that this is at the turning point. This is just a choice, okay? So then all motion is unbound, okay? In an exponential potential like this. That's the main point, okay? All motion is unbound. So phi starting from here will simply roll down all the way to phi equal to minus infinity. So therefore e to the power phi will go to zero. Therefore, f prime will go to zero. And remember that the boundary curve is given by z equal to f prime times delta. So z tilde. So z tilde equal to zero will happen, okay, uh, in this potential. So as long as you have a pure uh, e to the power phi potential, there is no bound motion. It's unbounded and to the left, it just goes to phi equal to minus infinity. So therefore you have black hole, okay? So simple Schwarzian gives you a black hole. There is no other way about it. Then you turn on a little bit of this minus uh, term. So it has a little bit of a dip. It has a little bit of a dip, okay? But not enough to give you any bound motion, okay? So, so in, the, in the next curve, let us say, that you start from again, uh, uh, you know, here again, it's unbounded motion. So again, a black hole. Then you turn on this epsilon equal to one here. That turns out a critical, critical value in the sense that if you have bigger epsilon, epsilon equal to 1.5, then you see what happens is that you start from this, this motion, okay? Um, and there's a continuity of the value of phi. Let us say you do your quench such that your value of phi remains zero and you come straight here. Okay, sorry, you come straight here. That's your epsilon equal to 1.5. Now you see that's a, that's a bound motion. You go from here to here, excuse me. You go from here. To here and you get hit by the potential. Then you come back again. Then you come back. So there's an oscillatory motion that you have uh, for this value of epsilon. 
and you never reach uh, phi equal to minus infinity. So therefore, uh, this never uh, hits zero, so Z never hits zero. So we have no black hole, okay? So the horizon just disappears. And the way it happens is because you have energy, you have pumped out energy of the system because you are, um, you are adding to the system negative energy, okay? So this, uh, this can happen, but you know, it, is, it is very easy to say that I have produced an epsilon here. But there is a, in order to have a negative epsilon, there's a fine tuning that you have to do between the perturbation that you have given and the state that you have started. Okay, that I don't have time to do that, but let me say that the fine tuning is necessary. And what we do is basically like the reverse process. So we start from some situation in which there is no black hole horizon. So there's an oscillatory motion and we pump in energy into the system like this. And um, we can, we can uh, look at the critical value closely and we find the evidence of a chop to transition that uh, in the infinitesimal neighborhood of this uh, uh, critical value, uh, you know, the, the incipient black hole. So the black hole has just about formed here. And there is a critical exponent of half that you get the, 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 the effective temperature of that black hole uh, is like the delta of epsilon to the power half. Okay, so this is this is what the uh, picture is. So this is the necessity of fine tuning that in order to have some uh, order one epsilon, you must choose the, the 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 spins that appear in this perturbation Hamiltonian to be the same as the. So there was this B S L space with some spin eigenvalues here. Spin eigenvalues. Here. And you have to use the same guys here. If you choose them to be different, okay, uh, almost soon it just goes sharply down to some uh, value which is way different from order one. So in order to survive this, um, so in order to go up, in order to uh, do what Kuklu and Malasena had done with, in which the um, horizon disappeared, that is to come down, okay. You have to make sure that there is a, uh, a non-zero epsilon that happens here. If you don't choose uh, fine tuning, then epsilon just falls to zero and you're back to epsilon e to the power phi and therefore black hole. So um, if you don't do any fine tuning, you are back to black holes, as you would expect. If you do fine tuning, then you can make black holes disappear uh, horizons disappear. So this is all that I have said here. So this is the first quench of Kuklu and Maldasena, and this is the second quench of ours. And um, as you can see, that uh, you begin with a thermal state, the horizon has disappeared, and you pump in now energy. So this is, oh, no, sorry. So this is indeed a gravitational collapse. Um, so if you, you can um, uh, translate these things in terms of the behavior of the stress tensor, near the boundary and you can show that the behavior of the stress tensor near the boundary has actually uh, a, a, a singularity here. So it's had a discontinuity um, here. And in case of the ADS black hole, so the, the stress tensor is, uh, so the, basically in what we find is that there is a discontinuity of the, sorry, this is, this is the, um, uh, sorry, there, this thing is, I don't know how to get rid of this, erase this. Oh, there is an eraser. Oh, never mind. Okay. Yeah, so the, the, um, so there is, there is the discontinuity. So this is like the null, null shell formation. Okay. So this is indeed like a gravitational collapse and um, so we are able to do these things, you know, uh, parallelly between the boundary theory and the bulk theory, and uh, that's what. Okay, so I think everybody is uh, must be exhausted by now, and um, thank you all for uh, listening out, and um, I'm done here. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Professor Mondal, for your nice and very elaborative contribution and. 
I'm hopeful that everybody have learned a lot from this, particularly I have learned a lot from this talk. <clears throat> and yeah, this is, this is the structure of the talk uh, that we ask question too much. Hopefully you didn't mind with that. No, no, not at all. I mean, otherwise, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, this is the same thing that I tell my students also. Otherwise, I'm just teaching my laptop. You know, yeah, the, yeah. The laptop. Mostly the other talks are like happening like that. And we decide, we have decided from the starting point that we will interact with the speaker as much as we can. So <laughs> that's, that's the fun. That's the yeah. fun. I mean, so, thanks for us. Yeah, hopefully you have enjoyed a lot with giving this talk and it will be posted in YouTube and once it, is, it will be posted, I will share the link and then you can share with anybody. And uh, yeah, so this was the th 53rd talk and uh, hopefully we can get back to you in our forum with some new work and new idea and uh, stay safe and healthy. That's the main point. And uh, uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, if you want to say something, yeah. No, thank you, Shantan, and uh, um, uh, thanks especially to my uh, friend Sudhakar, who has, uh, you know, stayed uh, with the talk for, I don't know, almost three hours or something, and um, uh, thanks a lot, Sudhakar, and uh, the, the questions you asked were very uh, interesting. And thanks to everybody else as well uh, for, for, for sticking out for so long. And um, uh, thanks a lot. Yeah. So, uh, sir, you wants to say anything? Professor Panda? That guy may have just left. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. So other people, those who are the participants, if, if you have any very specific question, you can ask. Very small, but remember it shouldn't be go long. It is already, uh, I think this this one is the longest talk. In the, <laughs> okay, so is there is any specific question? Um, I have a very um, basic question. Please ask. Uh, when we, uh, whenever we hear the word thermalization when the first time we hear about it it's usually in in in, in the sense of equilibrated systems and yes. we usually then use the maxwell velocity curve to say you know okay the system has equilibrated and this is the curve and this is the random velocity velocity distribution but here it was slightly different the the use the usage of the word thermalization was slightly different and i still can't sort of figure out where wherein exactly the main difference lies sometimes it seems to be overlapping sometimes it doesn't so it'll be helpful if you could shed a little light on that no 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 it is it is not different it is actually the 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 state thing that you say by maxwell distribution is precisely what let me let me go so because you know i am some of these things uh, in the beginning. Of course, it's written in, uh, uh, you know, said in terms of quantum statistical mechanics. So I'll tell you what, what, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, where is it? Oh, yeah, here. Ah, here. Yeah, you see, the what I'm saying is the following, that um, if you, don't use the language of reduced density matrix and so on and so forth. I'll tell you what this equation, what it means is precisely what you wanted to uh, do. So this means when you, um, you know, wh when you use the following uh, thing. So the definition of rho A of T, okay, and this stuff, okay. So let me say, let me say the following thing. Let me say just a single expectation value of some operator. This guy is the, so this guy is what? This guy is the trace with respect to rho A of T e and O. Now imagine that I have been able to prove this. Rho A of T e goes to rho A of beta, right? So then I replace that by rho A of beta. But 
the operator A is in the region A. So therefore, uh, you know, this expectation value is the same as the full expectation value of the theory. Okay. And rho A of beta, so basically I'm, all I'm saying is that this, this is the thermal expectation value. So here it is. Here it is. So maybe, you know, this part was not so clear, but let me say it now. This is your Boltzmann, you know, Gibbs ensemble that you want to produce. So I therefore have proved for you that this object, which is the quantum mechanical expectation value in the pure state goes to this object. Okay, so this is what would give you for, so if, if this, this O is like the velocity distribution for a gas, this would be the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Yes. Okay. Okay. Right. So that is that is what it it went by a little uh, little fast, but this is what. Yes. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Abhinash, do you have any question particular? Uh, not really. No. Thank you. Like uh, it was uh, quite a long and elaborative talk. Really. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, I think. Uh, Anurag, do you have any question? I can't able to hear you properly. Okay, anyways, if you have any question now, your turn is to write down to Gautam and Gautam will clear you. <laughs> After, okay. Yeah, and for all the other uh, participants, those who couldn't able to attend because of the time constraints and all, I will put it in YouTube and if you have any specific question, please ask the speaker. He will be happy to uh, give the answers. And uh, I feel Gautam, you will also feel very tired. So uh, see you and bye. And uh, probably the, today is the uh, Vijaya Dasami and Dashera and wishing you for the best. Thank you, same to you and same to uh, everybody else. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.